Hey, how you doing? This is John, and welcome to John's Long Box. We're here with Tonic Bowl. Who, you, 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 I think you're about to become my co-host. We've been, we've been talking so much lately. We're pretty close. We're pretty yeah. close. Yeah, yeah. So, he, yeah, there you go. You could be the Ed McMahon. That'd be a lot. But, well, my wife, you know, she's been like, you have to start a YouTube channel, right, just for, you know? And I'm like, uh, oh, I really don't want to. You know, that's a lot of work. And uh, so someday. So I'm just going to come on here as much as possible. Yeah, you're then, always and, welcome. You're and then say, welcome. no, no, I'm totally doing it. No, that, you're, you're, you know, it might be easier for you because I, I mean, literally, I've been doing it for two years before anybody even noticed me, you know? <laughs> right. You, you got a comic that's uh, successful, saving the world. Yeah. And, uh, so maybe, maybe you know, you 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 start out on a, on a on a on a higher plane of existence than me. You know, I I was making videos that had like three views. You know, and nobody. <laughs> well, yeah, and, deservedly and so. Watch my early videos that I I can't stand them. Well, that's it's real. You know, uh, it's like anything, whether it's comics or YouTube or whatever. Um, if someone can't survive, you know, you have to do it, even though dance like nobody's watching or some or dance like everybody's watching i suppose i don't know or, or don't dance stand in a corner in my case <laughs> <laughs> right. so uh, uh your campaign is ending on sunday right yes sir sunday at 1 p.m yeah sunday at 1 p.m is is uh is it gonna go in demand or anything like that afterwards um hold on I Okay, I had YouTube open, and all of a sudden I was hearing double. Oh, um, okay. Um, yeah, Sunday at 1 p.m., and I also have um, uh, On Call Heroes number one. You can sign up for the pre-launch. Okay. And, and uh, actually, I can post the link to that as well. I don't think it'll let you post the link. So send it to me in the private chat and then I'll post the link. Oh, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So you got saving the world number 11, which yes, means sir. that you, you not, not only you, you've done this 10 times already, you, you've shipped, you fulfilled 10, you know, 10 times. So, right. you know, reliable and you're, you're actually pretty quick. Yeah. I can't, I can't, I'm trying to remember what I think I, I discovered you around issue six and I can't believe right. it. I can't believe you're up to issue 11 already. Yeah, in four years, we've done, uh, we've shipped 10 comics, uh, uh, 10 of the main series. We shipped a, technically, we did a little spinoff uh, that we also printed and shipped with number one. And then we've done two trades, volume one and volume two. And, um, oh, and Lily and Wepawet was a standalone comic originally um so and then we've done we've we've funded and fulfilled uh, a few little well, we i did a coloring book stuff like that so i bet close to 15 yeah and, and that's just uh, you know per title we've done a few like indiegogo and stuff but you know usually duplicates but um so a lot a lot in for uh I think we're going on yeah yeah four years um nice i think we, yeah we, we're like four years and two months right now nice and, and you, you, for the most part you, you stick with kickstarter right you haven't had any yeah. problems no no i haven't had, uh see i started with uh indiegogo but uh my crowd just increasingly went to kickstarter so then i've been off and on with indiegogo but for some reason it's just everything uh everybody has moved over so i just follow the customers and uh so yeah i'm just stuck with kickstarter and uh occasionally we'll experiment elsewhere but largely uh that's just where my where my peeps are yeah all right and uh so first off i want to say thanks to haldir for throwing all the links in the chat uh haldir so this is saving the world number 11 this is live right now you can click on this uh, it's a comic that i really enjoy you know I, I don't do things like this for comics that i don't enjoy and uh since we're here well i gotta promote myself this is for my uh my sub stack you know i i i i send out maybe once a once a week i'll i'll send out something you know because my campaign heroic tales will be coming out in 14 days from now oh my god i'm so nervous excited but nervous so 
two weeks from today. Wow, two weeks from today, my stomach just started hurting. <laughs> I'm explain this too well. This is an email list. You sign up to this, and it's just an independent email list that I own and create. I won't spam you, and it's just so I can send you news about campaigns and hopefully upcoming campaigns and you know stuff like that. You know, not, I, I I don't do it too often because I don't I don't know about everybody. T Tonic, do you, do you when you back a campaign? Do you want to? million emails like i just want to know everything's cool still live comics coming <laughs> well, <laughs> or well, new campaigns coming right like uh you know updates i think i think uh updates every at least once a week updates now, once a week yeah now yeah only 10 people will see them out of two or three hundred people that back you but um they seem to those 10 people really want those you know uh those updates yeah. But, um, well, now, I, well, my point is, I, I backed a couple of things like board games. Yeah. And and then they just spammed it out, and I, I was getting emails about stuff oh. that they didn't care about, you know. And, uh, right. Like I, I I was getting annoyed, you know, like my phone, yeah. bing, bing, and I look it up, and it's like, dude, what what you know? Right, right. Now, and that what I'm saying is, it's going to be about my campaign. Right. Once once a week, I think is is fair, you know. Once mm -hmm. a week. Let the people know that I'm that I'm working on it, and for those of you who are interested, uh, we, we're starting on issue two for Heroic Tales already. You know, so you know, well, we're just waiting for the final pages of issue one. It's got to be lettered, and that's that's really it. So th it's going to be mostly done before the camp. So I'm hoping for a quick turnaround. I, I gave myself six months because, you know, I'd rather do the Scotty thing. Captain, we need four hours. Then he turns on and fixes it in eight minutes. Oh, you're <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Under promise and over deliver. Yeah. And so anyway, I'm babbling. We got people and uh I put the link to this in the in the chat. I th I thought it would be fun if for if people to come on, you know, roast us, we'll do whatever you want. Uh because uh why not? It's it's about fans, it's about people who like comics, and I thought it would be fun to to talk. Especially if if you read Saving the World, come on in and, and tell us what you think. Yeah. But, uh, but here's exciting. You got a, another campaign on call heroes. Now this yeah. is not live yet, right? No, it, uh, it'll be a, uh, it's about a, a week out or so. So oh, after, awesome. yeah, after saving the world, number 11 wraps, then yeah, just a week later, this one will launch and that will hopefully knock on wood, just be our, our ongoing, um, cycle that by the time I'm shipping number 11, the Uncle Heroes is wrapping, and then it'll be shipping, and I'll be launching Saving the World number 12, and we'll just leapfrog from Uncle Heroes to Saving the World. Oh, cool. Which, which are, you know, the, the major difference is that I draw Saving the World, and uh, uh, Shabby draws Shabby and Illustrator Monk, and we'll probably have other guests will draw on call heroes. So, and I is might on, is on call heroes one story each comic. Yeah. Yeah, uh even even more so than uh, saving the world is like that too. But this one even more so that um I wanted to stick with a very strict um monster of the week and and stories that are very self-contained um and and they do run when it cr comes to the, like chronological they are running parallel with saving the world so you would just start jumping back and forth but the the majority of the kind of like lily and Wepiwet and all the more complicated things are saving the world and on call heroes is uh more hyper focused on the uh, the super team of Kira, Nora, Hobo Girl, and all of them, and fleshes out their daily lives a lot more than I can get to. In I'm excited. It, yeah. this, is this going to be Illustrator Monk's first interior comic book work? Uh, third. So he, oh. did, he did one page in Saving the World number two. He then did a short in like 20... 18 or 2019 for this uh, little horror comic off uh, that I forget what it's called. It don't matter. So anyways, so 
it's it don't matter. It ain't your comic. <laughs> no, it ain't my comic. I don't give a shit. Um, <laughs> it's a uh, so very rare, <laughs> but um, so and he's doing um. In hey, on call hero, uh, on call heroes number one, Shabby does the majority, and one of the major benefits is he has a, a just a completely different uh, style and strengths than me. So I write the script specifically, like if I drew them, they would be bad, but those it's his <laughs> strength. So, um, uh, and and sometimes it's not that he can draw them better; that he will, if I say, I need a huge crowd and a car is driving through them, right? I wouldn't be very good at drawing that particularly. And he could go, I don't know, but I'll figure it out. Like, okay. he, he's a little more determined at, no, I'll get this to work. And um, this current issue, they're and, and out. And you're the boss. Just, just whip them. Just yell at yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I don't want to hear any lip from you. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Did I stutter? No, you no. Back in the basement, here's a bucket of slop. You'll get a second bucket when you turn in a page. Right. <laughs> yeah. No. But he's he's really. Uh, when I gave him the first script and he was kind of handed back, he I could see he's very good at um, the hardest things to draw. So that's where he excels because this takes uh, the first issue takes place on uh, on this lake. So you're going to have constant backgrounds, right? There is no, oh, I'll just draw a little silhouette of buildings. No, it has to be trees. You see the lake. You see the the trees on the other side of the lake. Uh, there's uh, cars and boats and all these things. And, uh, and also where the characters are in relation to each other and to the lake, all these things matter. And um, I'm, I'm, my strength is people themselves, their facial expressions. Yes, you are very good with expression. Yeah. Them, them interacting but when it comes to me showing them at the lake getting into a boat that is not my strength but uh and he was doing all this amazing like the action and all this amazing stuff far better than i could so my script just leans into that where i go oh my god you're gonna lead into the to, to the to the strength of your artist right right and i got i had the craziest ideas i was like haha but i don't have to draw it and oh, so yeah, I'm going to save the difficult stuff for someone else. Right, right. And, cause, and I had a script that um, Kira, Wolf. Kira and Nora are racing through the city in, in Kira's car. And it's, uh, um, you, you know, that French, I think it's French Connection, where that Pontiac Le Mans is racing through the city, yeah. crashing through stuff. Well, Kira drives a Pontiac Le Mans. And I was like, that, I want to see that in comic. And I was like, ah, but. I would suck at that. I love cars, but I can't draw them for unknown reasons. Like I can draw them good enough, but this needs to be visceral. And I was like, ah, I know what Uncle Heroes number two is going to be about. <laughs> it's funny because uh, I, I have an idea for, uh, uh, I, 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 I thought I was so original until I found out so many other people. I have a, a Western mm -hmm. horror story that I want to do. Oh, right, right. And nobody wants to draw horses. And I'm like, well, I can't just not have horses. You know, right. like in order to be a Western, there has to be certain things. It's and kind of important. Yeah. You know, I grew up with horses. And so I have no problem. I always found that crazy where people like, oh, I hate horses. It's like a horse just looks like it. I mean, it's like a dinosaur, right? But different, <laughs> you know? I don't want like, to draw my Western, but put in dinosaurs. Just why not? <laughs> That'll fix your artist problem. But, um, <laughs> but no, I hear that a lot. Oh, horses. Well, I got a horse dude. Right. And, and I do know the hardest part is the head, right? Their heads and seeing that head move in different dimensions is kind of hard, but I don't know. I just find them cool because the musculature and stuff, but I like drawing anything like organic. I find like, so I find that you know, like tanks and airplanes and stuff like that. No. And I love them. I just, my brain don't think like that. I think there's too much. I think so, I like flowy organic rounded things like muscles yeah, and boobs your and stuff. artwork is very is very is like well you draw girls so obviously there's curves right but yeah you, you, i guess you don't like straight lines right 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 yeah the overly cut like that stuff i go because yeah i want to be able to draw cars so bad and i love like cars are the uh, like one of my number one obsessions 
And uh, the fact that I can't grasp them, like to draw them accurately, like in a good, like to look cool. I have no idea how that is. Like, why can't my brain process that? I don't know. So, so let's, 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 for, for those of you who are, a bunch of people just came in. So let's, we'll start at the beginning here. So we got Saving the World number 11 is live until Sunday. And I recommend the series. I really, I really, I mean, I saw it out tonic ball after, after I, 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 the story I always tell is I ordered one to six. Yeah. And I forgot to order number five. And, and it bothered Tonic Ball so much that I, that he just threw in a number five for me. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I, now now I now I gotta buy his comics for the rest of eternity. That's the way. That, we're that at. was an ex, that was an expensive free number five. Now you're indebted forever. I know. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Now I get in the basement and get the slop. And then uh, <laughs> and then uh, you have uh, coming up. I can't believe it's next week. You're gonna go active with uh, yeah. On Call Heroes number one, which we were just talking about. It's it's. I, 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 it's it's for, it's a business, right? They're gonna charge. Uh, no. No. Uh, okay, so it's not heroes for hire. It's just heroes on call. Right. Uh, they would like to. It's a failed business, probably. Um, it's, <laughs> it's very similar to, like, uh, the. Uh, they're still getting invitations to entertain at birthday parties. So it's them trying. So it be it at right. least it has, at least begins with a good effort to make this something, but it is not a successful business at all. <laughs> and you said sooner or later, I, I forget if I said it or you said it, but sooner or later, somebody's going to hire him for a bachelor party. Right, it's, right. It's two bus girls on a poster, you know? <laughs> right. It's, it's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> and also guys, uh, I threw the link in here. You can click on this and join us and, and join in the conversation. Um, You know, I, I thought that would, would be fun. I'm I'm trying a, a new uh, illustrator monk here. Illustrator, pop in, talk to us if you want. You know, I I think it would be fun to start talking with fans. I, I somebody on Twitter said the other day that they're kind of tired of talking to the same twenty talking heads. I was like, right. you know what? Let, let, let's talk to fans. You like? Um, I just you know, I I thought it, I thought it'd be. As a matter of fact, at ten o'clock tonight, I'm going to do a fan cast. It's, it's going to open up and talk to fans about comics. A lot of people said they were interested. This could this could flop spectacularly. <laughs> so tune in to watch me filibuster for an hour while nobody shows up. That'll be fun. And we got Illustrator Monkey in the chat. I did er he did internal pages. I can't even read. This will be real fun. I can't even read. for internal pages. I did 15 pages for Tales from the Stacks and page five for the Lost Pages. Then Tonic Comic. Oh, cool. Illust Illustrator Monk. I. Really like that Phoebe the Witch that you drew. I, oh man, I, I I would really like to like see that. And now you're doing Possum Girl, which is a, a webtoon. And it and uh, if you send Tonic or me the uh, the uh, web link, we'll throw it in the chat there, Illustrator Monk. And I gotta mm -hmm. say, it was your ad that I saw in Alterna Comics that uh, that really attracted me to Saving the World, and I was so disappointed to see that it was actual Tonic Moles on. <laughs> <laughs> And what is your relationship with Monk? He's one of my favorite artists. Yeah, illustrated Monk. All kidding aside, I th there's like an old retro look to it, but it's modern at the same time. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if I'm describing that properly, but I would love to see illustrated Monk do like pinups that that they put on like World War II planes. Yeah, you yeah. Know? He's so good. No. And, and one day, if if Tonic and I ever do that, the script, I would love to have illustrated Monk. Do, do 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 some work on that i just i just love yeah. it yeah we have to i don't believe this law you don't have any friends you, you just pay him <laughs> i know <laughs> what a paid friend isn't a friend i feel like a paid friend is the only one you can depend on yeah I, I, yeah I, I had to give friends i had to give kids chocolate chip cookies to hang out yeah. with me in the garden so and, okay now there's proof that he's my best friend ever i pay him really shitty <laughs> If it was about the money, that guy'd be gone. <laughs> so yeah, send, send the link to either myself or Tonic, and we'll we'll throw it in the chat to to uh, to uh, Possum Girl. Oh yeah, and I can I, find it. He he draws some of the the cutest girls too. Yeah, you know I think uh, um because I was thinking, you know, I often think like J. Scott Campbell, like there's some of that idea there but you say like the the bomber girls on the side i was like yeah it's like 
a Japanese J. Scott Campbell from the 1920s painting on the side or 1930s painting on the side of bombers. That's kind of, yeah, that's that feel. There's a retro, but then this modern with some of, you know, uh, uh, mega influence and stuff like that. But um, everybody seems to love it quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if you see his interiors, though, uh, that, that uh, I forgot about Lost Pages, but also uh, Tales from the Stacks is the first interiors I saw of his. And uh, like detail, like you wouldn't believe, like buildings and all that. Um, yeah, his, his architectural drawings. You know, it kind of reminds me of Jim Lee when Jim Lee just goes to town drawing a building and you're like, son of a gun. Like yeah, me, when, I get... When Jim Lee actually draws. <laughs> right, right. When he draws. For me, like I go, okay, I got to draw a building. Cube with windows. And I'm like, done. Person walking by it. Whereas, yeah, uh, you know, Monk will do this. He did this in that in that um, Tales from the Stack. It was like a uh, old country... Uh, like a plantation house type thing. And uh, now, now I got to ask, how can I get tales from the stacks? Uh, I have no light. <laughs> I have no idea. Wait, I haven't got it yet. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't think you can, buddy. I think oh. I got it. No, 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 no. That's true. It took a long time to, he, he it took a long time, but he did fulfill it. Um, Cause it was a couple of years before. Hey, the listen, if you have any copies laying around or if it's on eBay, let me know. I, I, I would love to get a book, a full book of your art. That would be awesome. And, I'll, you know, there will be, what, five pages, you said, in in, uh, in tonic stuff? Uh, yes. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, I think we summoned. I, 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 I said the name, and now he is summoned. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. I'll say you mine for a bunch of money. <laughs> um, I only have the one copy of tale, of the Tales from the Stacks. Oh. oh. Okay. How are you doing? It's good to finally finally meet you. If 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 this is considered a meeting, but I guess in the modern world, this is the best way to meet people. I'm not I got said a, a big I'm fan not of you. Doing a face reveal. I'm sorry. No face reveal. Okay. What's up? We gotta we gotta save that. That's a stretch call. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, 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 where, where do you live? In in Utah. Oh, in Utah. Okay, okay. So we're all over the place. I'm in New York, and I, I you're in Oklahoma, right, Tonic? Yes. Yeah, we're, we're all over the place. We are almost coast to coast. Yeah, we're, yours is the best piece. Of, I assume you're talking Illustrator Month. Yeah. So you you guys did you get you actually met once, right? Did, like only once at a convention. Yeah, yeah, we went to uh, the Wichita, Wichita Comic Con um, last year and hung out and stuff. And uh, we're we're gonna try to do at least one this year, uh, but then like twenty twenty five, try to get out more. But um, you know, for crowdfunded comic creators, it almost has to be your, like you're going on vacation because. Well, no, if you're, say you're uh, a semi-big name at DC Marvel, you might have five people come by, by your table. Like, those people go because they get paid to show up. Right. right? So they're not doing much of anything. Because I think, the I went to Fan Expo, and uh, it was Coates. Uh, uh, what was the Coates guy that was kind of popular at Marvel for a short time? Time Dan? Coates. Donnie Coates. Or Donnie Cates, yeah. yeah. Donnie Cates. Yeah. yeah, Donnie Cates was there. And that was the only person that had, like, any type of line. Everybody else just sat there, you know, playing on their phones. But um, so it kind of is expensive to hit those conventions. But when you go and someone actually shows up, like uh, in Texas, a guy showed up that backs, backs my comic. So I got to meet a fan in person. And that was pretty, you know. That's cool. See that that could be a stretch goal. You personally deliver the comics all around the country. That's right. The shipping will be horrible, but I'll do it. I think that's a pretty accurate description. Saving the World's a really fun comic with big boobs. It's pretty accurate. 
that's my that's my going thing right now and uh so the uh on call heroes i didn't know how how much enthusiasm there'd be for that you know i had no real idea but um uh, it's doing it's sign like early signups is is pretty freaking uh, big, big for me like usually my top is like 130 followers by the time i launch um after a week or so and we're about at 100 and it's just been a couple of days and i i think most of those was after the first few hours well, you're get you got a pretty good reputation as, as a guy who makes an entertaining comic you, yep. you're pretty regular and, and you deliver and, yep. and your comics look great you know matter of fact when when i'm all ready i was going to talk to you about like the printer that you use and the paper stock you know we'll have yeah. that issue at, at some point yeah and i talked to yeah me and uh, uh brian baugh when he was talking about it as um you know a lot of people they don't even think about it but when i was doing it yeah, that was every issue. I was like, nah, nah, this ain't quite right. It's slightly off, and it was driving me crazy until I found the right printer, the right um, cover stock and interior stock, the the paperweights and stuff. And um, and sometimes it don't even make sense, so I had to experiment back and forth before I finally found um, uh, the, right, the right everything to make it feel like a real comic book. Yeah. Because a lot of guys... And this is all personal opinion, but you know they'll have the 130 pound covers that are like freaking cardboard. I was like, yeah, yeah. I don't particularly like that. No, because you know, it just don't feel like that's not a comic book, you know? Right. Yeah. And, and so I do a, it's an 80 pound gloss cover, and then a, a 60 pound uncoated interior, and that is like the closest I could get, like you can get with offset print press that that feels like offset print press but is actually a digital printer um and so anyways yeah i nerd out on that that's that's you know, yeah. what, what do we got it i think for sales you should get the price point there that's one thing yeah i you know what's funny is a couple of a couple of people pushed back on that because my, my comic I'm, i, I want to do for ten dollars yeah. You know, this day, and a couple of guys were getting mad at me. That's too low, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, like, it, it's a comic. <laughs> you know, it's, right. it, it, should be, it should be affordable. And then they were like, well, then why don't you make it $8? If you, Dude, you know, how about I just yeah. give it away for free? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, right. And, and if you're worried about price, why don't you know, because his comic was 15 I'm like, well, then sell it for 35 if you, you know what you want to make. But there has to be a sweet spot someplace. And yeah. I, I, I'm new. I'm new at this game. I, I, I want to do the best that I can do. But I also don't want to. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> you know, in in four years that I've funded, like crowdfunded my comics and watched other people crowdfund, um, I've never seen a I've never seen a budget or a value orientated comic succeed, and so uh -oh. you know I always see oh well I'm doing mine for uh, just. Uh, five dollars right and they say yeah i'm making a lot less profit but i'll make it up in quantity of sales and then they get 37 backers right it's uh -oh. some, sometimes nice logic, point, everybody <laughs> yeah, so sometimes logic doesn't work right and but no but i think that like at 10 to 15 dollars um yeah, that's that's where you're probably going to succeed better. And it don't totally make logic. Like, what if I sold it for a dollar? Well, everybody will assume that comic's only worth a dollar. Yeah, and, there there is a little cycle. It's funny that you said that because I did read that uh, a couple stores had sales, and they're like, they, like, oh, we opened in 1950, so we're going to reduce our prices to to 1950 prices. And yeah. people were like, well, can we have the regular menu, please? Like, they thought they were going to get, like, garbage steaks or garbage, you know, dinners. So, right. they, you know, and, uh, you know, so. Yeah, and, you know, there, there's that whole thing where if you charge nine ninety nine, they go, that's a great deal. You charge $10, they're like, ah, that's too expensive. Yeah, yeah I you, didn't want to write nine ninety nine. I'm like, $10 just yeah, less. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that only works in stores. But, you know, there's a lot of irrational behavior. Yes. 
people are irrational. I just want to say we got a we got a uh, uh, I can't even speak Illustrated Monk's link over here. If you want to check out the peculiar possum girl, do, do you want to tell us Monk a little bit about this? Is um, Monk still here? Yeah. Yeah, I can oh. I can talk a little bit about possum girl. Sure. Um, it was kind of my since I knew I was never going to get to do Squirrel Girl for Marvel, I created this character. Um, originally, it started with a red panda and then a, a raccoon, but settled on a possum because it's a little more trashy, which I think works better. Okay. Okay. I, I, I just want to address what Perth says over here. 22 page for $10, 48 page for $20, 68 pages for 20 Roughly what I expect. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of agree. Uh, mine is, my comic is uh, about 30 pages. So maybe maybe I am, uh, maybe I should go 15. But it's, it's, it's set in stone in the first issue. We'll see. We'll see. See, I, I, do, I do 32 pages. So I'm right on point at $15 in the middle. Yeah. From my point of view, I really enjoy saving the world, but it got a little too pricey. I enjoy your work and a bunch of people. I, I don't know, but you know. I, I got I got some sales on my website. He's got sales <laughs> on his website, and uh Tonic Mole's gotta eat too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh this this is gonna I don't mean this to sound in any way bad, but I, I, I have a full time job, you know what I mean? So I'm, right. I'm not but your full time job is making the comic. Yeah. So so we have a little different which, you know, on one hand, you know, yeah, people go, oh, that's a crazy thing to do. Uh, technically, it wasn't my, it wasn't super my choice because uh, uh, I had a whole health issue the first year I was doing the comic. Oh, and, no. I, and I worked tires, manual labor my whole life. I couldn't really do that anymore. And so I was like, comics, I guess. And so far, it's it's been pretty good. It's gone, it's gone. I don't intend on stopping that. And one time I was like, uh, this is, you know, I'm just scraping by. Maybe I should do something else. And my wife was like, you can't do anything else. So, and I was like, it made me feel better. I was like, you're right. It don't matter. I'm not qualified for any other job than being locked in the basement drawing. Drawing. So it don't matter if I succeed or not. It is what it there is. You go. You get, you get, you, the, the, it's a little premium to keep tonic bowl inside the house exactly yeah that's right and if and if Away you see society she, she yeah you know <laughs> she's yeah she's shielded from society it's for the best <laughs> yeah and so that on call heroes that's probably launching in a, a week and a half probably um uh i had introduced a character named uh alice and she's in a lot of the issues after number i think she's introduced in number four and she's one of the gang but she don't have uh superpowers or anything yeah, they rescued her right they rescued her and uh i had kind of an idea she was a, she had the possibility of being an interesting character but i was so over like overwhelmed with hobo girl and kira and nora and everybody else that she kind of just appeared in the like occasionally in the background but monk he was more like hey i, I know this character right so he did sketches and all this type stuff and so we did a a solo that's drawn by him but i i wrote this i wrote the script for it but it was informed largely by his characterization because yeah i never I didn't flesh out the character like there's room there's, there's room for alice she got rescued and the next thing you know she's sleeping on the couch exactly and she's uh i had all these ideas of what type of person like character she was but i never really infused it right i was running on autopilot with her a lot but yeah uh monk's characterization of her i was like that's that's right that's what i should have that's what i should have like expanded on and so we have a short that's in on call heroes that is uh drawn by him uh script by me that explores who she is and all this and then there is a a, a, a possum girls uh, uh, stri uh, comic strip oh, that'll cool. be on Call Heroes as well, where she meets um, uh, Hobo Girl. Which, oh, so possum girl! 
is is this a interdimensional multiverse thing, or is she existing in the uh, in the uh, yeah. world universe? Uh, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Monk, Monk, you got any, you got any saucy stories you could tell working working with uh, Tonic Mole? Saucy stories. <laughs> um, you. I, I don't know if I have any saucy stories. I'm a boring as hell. <laughs> Well, yeah, we went. We went to a convention, and he went to bed early. Yeah. Let's see. He, he doesn't actually sleep. No, I don't sleep. Yeah. Uh, so. He lurks. Yeah, I lurk. Yeah, Monk's just sleeping on the hotel bed, and I'm just standing over him, staring. Every and, time I woke up, Tonic Mole was staring at me with those beady little mole eyes. Um. It, Brian Bow says hello. Just chop, uh, pop it in to say hi. I'm stuck watching my kid this evening, but I'm lurking in the chat. Good, Brian Bow. If uh, those of you who know, he he's the the guy behind Wolf and Batsy, a comic that I am a big fan of. Brian Bow is a, a friend of the channel. I consider him a friend. Oh, here we go. We got a we got Wolf and Batsy comics right here. Look at that. I'm reading. Uh, the, I, I'm reading through him. He's reading through Saving the World, and I'm le reading through Wolf and Batsy. And uh, we're seeing if either of us have a uh, court case for Wolf and Betsy versus uh, Lily and Whippoet. <laughs> we're gonna find out. I'd like to think that I was the facilitator of this of this friendship. Yeah, <laughs> and, think, and uh, we're gonna we're we're gonna do we'll do something eventually someday. We'll see, but we're both very busy. It, yeah, and he's the only other person I know that's on past a tenth issue. He's on, yes. he's on twelve, and well, thirteen will be around the bend. Yeah, he he just closed his campaign for for his twelfth issue, and uh, he wants to do something special. Since it's a horror based car comic, it's right. a no brainer to do something for issue thirteen. Thirteen, and, that's like. And I will say this: I'm going to be as cryptic and confusing as possible on purpose. In Heroic Tales number one, Wolf and Batsy are in it, but they're not in it. Mm. <laughs> now yeah. he's halfway through saving the world and he says it's awesome yeah and, and from the chat wants to say hobo girl when she appeared was both hot and gross yeah so so is tonic mole to be fair <laughs> that's exactly right uh, uh hobo girl is my self-insert i had the 13th like on this video <laughs> <There you go. laughs> It's a it's a signal. It's, it's, a signal. it's destiny. It, it's funny because people people talking about self inserts and everything like uh you know the patriarch has a beard, so I was like oh is he is he your self insert? I'm like I wish the self <laughs> the patriarch my character from Heroic Tales is more cooler and, and a cooler guy than I could ever possibly be. In issue three, I'm gonna debut a character. I'll just tell you his name is Augie Carmichael. That'll be my self insert. <laughs> and you, you wait it, to issue three when you're like, that's what you think you are. <laughs> right. <laughs> my, my favorite self insert, it wasn't a self insert, it was literally him drawing himself as a character in his own comic. But in Ghost World, where um, one of the girls, I, I think it's Enid, is obsessed with this comic book, this underground comic book artist. And it shows her imagining him, and he's this refined like guy from the fifties with a pipe, right? He's super smart and all this stuff. And they go to see him, and he's bald, hunched over this table, like all creepy and stuff. And they just go and turn around and leave, right? Don't meet your heroes. <laughs> well, that was his self insert, and it's funny because that that was semi accurate. He, of course, very mean to himself, but. Like, I always thought about meeting Daniel Klaus, the writer, and it's so intimidating, right? Like, he seems like he would be so intimidating and just, like, where he's so much smarter and, and just scary. But he's uh, he's just a goofball. Like, I oh, see him. That's in, great. I, I see was him getting nervous. I thought you were going to tell me he was a jerk, you know? Like, no, no. When you, liked, when you like somebody, like, a, a friend of mine met David Bowie, and he said he was the coolest, nicest guy in person. Right. I, yeah. When he was telling me the story, I was like, please don't tell me David Bowie was an ass. Right. <laughs> no, come find, Daniel Klaus is just really good at getting uh, portraits taken, like photos of himself. So his photos are 
Because, like, you go, whoa, that guy's intimidating. But in real life, he's just a normal dude. He's just a normal, like, 90s grunge dude. And <laughs> Lillian, what the what? For the yeah, win. That, that, they're my favorite, too. Yeah. I, I, I have to say, I, I don't know if anybody knows uh, uh, Mike Gustavich. Mike Gustavich was, is a legendary comic artist. Who, he did the Justice League for a while, and he did a... Uh, he, he created the Justice Machine, and uh, he did Iron Man for a while. And I don't know why I had it in my head that he was a crotchety old cranky pants. <laughs> I started talking to him. He's going to be doing a, a very cover up on my cop. He is the nicest, sweetest, goofiest guy. Yeah. You know, and he calls me young man. He's like, okay. <laughs> he's just like, he's like the kind grandpa in your neighborhood that, you know. Yeah. I don't know how I, I got this idea that he was a crouchy old guy. What's it? He's probably awful. So, no, you said he was a good guy, right? No, he's nice. He, he seems like a real cool guy. And, uh, <laughs> and so, uh, oh, now, speaking, of, that was, so when I went to that Wichita Comic Con, me and Monk was showing up there for our table, and Jim Lawson was there. So it was kind of like the trio the three yeah. main How people. cool is that? A guy that you love their art, and now you're hanging out with them and he's doing comics for you. you right, know? right. And so uh, I, uh, hanging out with uh, Lawson and me and Monk hanging out with Lawson and stuff. And uh, it was funny because we were all, the three of us, so much alike. And I we ran to, like, me oh, and Monk. Monk, were, Monk you, my estimation of you just went down. You're, you're like him? No. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Less mentally deficient. Like, he's like, the nor like, if I wasn't dropped on my head as a child, I could have been monk. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, my mother's got butter fingers. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is what we get. And so. Mom liked to drink. What are you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> what you going to do? You what know? you going to do? Yeah, I have to pay the repercussion of her alcoholism during pregnancy. <laughs> but, uh. So, but, uh, so yeah, uh, hanging out with Lawson and Monk yeah. and all, we just had the exact same, uh, we don't give a shit. We're like, yeah, that's good. That's fine. Like Lawson was just like, yeah, that's, that's fine. <laughs> we were just there to, you know, have fun or whatever. And, um, would you consider, was it, you know, I, cause that's something that I, I, I never even considered was going to conventions. You know, yeah. I'm flattering myself to think that like people would, you know, <laughs> I, I don't have a comic app, so everything right. is on hold. But uh, was what you would you said it's just like an expensive vacation. Like, you, you is there lines, it, people hanging out, talk? It, de I mean? it depends. It depends how good you are now. I. Oh, so I'm doomed. <laughs> well, no, it's it's a totally it's just a completely different business model. Right. When you're at the Comic Con now. The guy that did, uh, you know, Metal Shade? Is it? No. no what's the? Uh, I think it's Metal Shade. Anyways, it's this crowdfunded comic. That dude and his wife are raking in bank at Comic Cons. Uh, but him and his wife, their, you know, their art is very lucrative on its own. Nobody, they don't even have to know they do a comic. The art is just selling. Uh, but I was sitting across from Ron Z, who does. Um, uh, Patriotica. Okay. Uh, you know, and uh, man, that dude, his business sense is off the, it, he ju he's the writer and then he just hires artists and he's hired some like legends that I would kill to be able to get. Um, uh, and, but I just, he just sat over there in that chair, right? But he had the spread of all the posters and he knew how to target customers with the posters he had and all this and there was just people coming up constantly right it's yeah you just have to learn how to be a comic-con uh, dealer I, I wish i could remember his name but he has a comic called project now 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 osis and mm -hmm. it, it, i think it's it's the next issue is about to launch and he's got some he, and he's a writer and he hires yep. artists but this guy man he didn't know anything about crowdfunding. He he fronted yeah. all of his comics, did it all by himself, and he would just go to Comic Cons and sell it. He was selling saying he was making like five grand at convention because this guy yeah. is a salesman. Right. And we, we we he he was on my channel 
and then he was on a with comic book team up with RJ and, and I, and we were talking afterwards, and he was just like, you know, he, he was like, oh, thanks for introducing me to all of this crowdfunding stuff. He he didn't yeah. know, but him and his girlfriend were just bang, 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 sell, sell, sell. He said he had it down. Just you know, talk to everybody, and it's funny because he's a construction worker. Like mm-hmm. me, you know, he was working in New York and he, he, he got laid off for whatever reason. And he was just like, I, I got to do something. And he never went back. He's making bank just, just so. Yeah. And, and his comic looks phenomenal. I yeah. haven't read it, obviously, you know, but, you know, so that's what I was curious about is, is going to conventions something because I'm, I'm so shy about selling myself. You know, I'm very self right. and everything like that. You like, just have to become the opposite of that. Yeah. But- I have, whatever I'm doing, chuck it. Yeah, do the, could like, you, yeah, could you be somebody else? Yeah. That would help. That yeah. would help a lot. Yeah. It's, if, the biggest problem is you. The problem is all here. <laughs> right, right. But so, yeah, I, when I watch those guys, it is, they just have this, it's a completely, oh man, Bud Root, I'd love to have him do a very, he's one of my like top five, yeah. right? Because it's so much a big inspiration of everything. But, this um, is going to sound weird, but when I saw his art, I was like, he's still alive? Because I the, thought he was like one of those classic artists from the 50s that just can't be topped. Oh, you know, when right, you look right. at like Warren magazines and stuff right. like that? I, he's been around for, he's he's not a young pup. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, but I thought he was like, like, like Frisetta right. and, and all those legends that right, like, right. you know, in the long ago times that, you know, Al Williamson and guys like that. If you believe in what you're doing, sell it. Yes, yes. I, I, I get lectured every once in a while by, by a couple of my buddies. They're like, stop being so shy. You know, be direct. You know, and, you, and, you're not conning anybody. You know, I, I hate the word grifter because it just seems like yeah. it seems like words go into fashion and people use them without mm-hmm. really, you know, for a while it was incel that it was grifter. They're like, th- there's all these like fashionable insults that just pop up and everybody right. uses them until, yeah. until you insult them. Gets, if, gets released by the computer matrix. Illustrated, Mark. I'm so sorry. We're, t- we're talking so long. Uh, it, it, anything you want to say? Anything you want to bring up? I, I Sometimes I forget and talk too much. Uh, that's why I'm here to just kind of fill a spot on the bottom here. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing a terrific job. Yeah. It makes us look like we got more friends, right? Yeah. So- yeah. There's actually no such person as Illustrator Monk. We just no, created no, no. it to make it make it look like we have a friend. Yeah, he's just an AI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, oh, Marcus Kellegrew knows everybody. Marcus Kellegrew is like the uh, is like the uh, Forrest Gump of comics. He just he, wanders he needs, through and, and and meets everybody, knows everybody. He needs to introduce me to Bud because that's a guy I'd like to at least say hello. Yeah, you know, other than that, because I have. Some people I have like uh, uh, Jimmy Pomiati and all these guys I met on Twitter, but some like J- James Obar. Man, I talked to that guy at a Comic Con for like an hour and a half, and but he has no online presence. So I've for years I've been trying to get a hold of him, but he is elusive, elusive as hell. And I wow. think I think I've tried to talk uh, about a guy with a cult following. Yeah, and and you know he's been had in a rough spot for a long time. I mean, always. That's where his comic come from. Was his he drew his rough spot, and uh, but he kind of, he he kind of shook himself off, I guess, and uh, kind of sought sought out help and stuff. And uh, uh, he he had announced like, yeah, I'm back in it. I'm ready to draw some comics. And uh, uh, but I I've been trying to reach out to him and stuff because yeah, his art is a kind of a big deal for me. Yeah, I, I like, like I said, I, I, I it's gonna drive me nuts. I can't remember the guy's name, but the comic is Project Now Osis N A O I S. But uh, he said he doesn't have, he didn't have an online presence. He didn't even know about this, and yet this guy was making bank at conventions just because right. this guy is a salesman. And F in the chat says Ethan is a great salesman. We're talking about Ethan Van Skyver. Yeah, he has no shame. He believes what he's making, but, but what he's making is good. Right. That helps. It's, it's it's objectively good. It's an objective. Cyber Frog is an objectively good comic. You know, yeah. and, and, he, and he he charges like twenty five dollars for for his comic. But like, I I, I I could never do this correctly. But you know, you, you got this toy. You got a comic. You got a side comic. Mm-hmm. To the point where like I need to point out to people, it's it's really cheap when you when you break down everything that you got. You know, he, so 
What, 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 I, I, oh, okay. F in the chat. I, he says that's the point. Okay, I thought you were like saying like a bad thing, but uh, if I had Ethan's talent, I'd have no shame either. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you, you know, believe what you do? Good. Yes, I do believe. I it, it's a labor of love. I'm, I'm a, I I really do think I'm making a great comic. I'm making a fun comic. Um, I got so many plans. So yes, yes, and you're absolutely right. I need to, like Eth, like uh, Tonic Ball said, change everything about me. You know, <laughs> and, and become a more confident seller. Yes. My yeah. whole humor has been like self-effacing and stuff like that. So, yes, you're absolutely right. And so, here one, we go. Oh, then sell it. Thank you, F in the chat. Maybe oh, what yeah. I needed was a pep talk. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well. Well, Herrenberg, here's another guy. Uh, another guy that's been a, 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 a friend of the channel since almost day one. He was the one of the first people. Him and RJ were the two first people that reached out. And, you know, he sent me a comic, and I was like, "Well, I told my wife, look, somebody actually watched my channel and mailed me a comic book." <laughs> oh, and Marcus again. Project this. This is a, a link to the to the gentleman's comic that I was talking about. Check it out. You know, tell me what you think. I, you know, I, I didn't read it yet. And then we got some freak in the, in the chat. Long live the king, which is me. There we go. I think I missed last year, Heronberg, but okay. Yes, Heronberg, for those of you who don't know, he, he's based in Pittsburgh, and he he, uh, he makes a web television show with actors and actresses, you know, mostly female characters, and then uh, maybe once a year he'll put out like a supplemental comic. I think issue, Heronberg, correct me if I'm wrong, but issue four is, is about to uh, come, and, and I, I, I get a kick out of him. I get a kick out of him, you know? And thank you for the chat for the pep talk. Sometimes, sometimes I need that. You know, it's it, it, you know, be be a little stronger salesman. I got to be my own Stan Lee because there's no more Stan Lee left, right? Mm -hmm. the, the 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 king is dead, and we all have to uh, rise up and become the emperors of, of our own kingdom. How is that for a weird weird? Hail Jim Lee! Jim Lee's in the chat. Hey Jim, <laughs> want to do a cover for my comic? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll take a second mortgage on the house. <laughs> <laughs> now i'll tell you who i just sometimes i I'll, I'll just look at guys who are really successful and then like, like try to do a uh a impersonation of them right if you can't do it just mimic the guy who can um some of the best sell one of the best salesmen in comics is uh brian polito who does lady yes Dance. you watch his you watch his videos that's how you sell a comic and uh ron z is very similar except for he doesn't have a lot of like he doesn't have the public face of Plato like in the videos he just has that product presented in the similar way as Plato. so i watch those two guys and i go if i could if i could harness that uh but with Plato, he's just a natural born salesman like uh because i was telling my wife i was like yeah i should try to get into that more because uh Plato uh, Polito will be like, I want to thank y'all. Uh, we got the the latest Lady Death has launched, and it is completely badass. And uh, let's check out some of the products we have. First off, we have the standard cover, amazing cover with art by yada yada, and amazing interiors. These things just blow me away. Like this thing is badass and it's rocking. But also, for just twenty five dollars more, you can get the Chrome variant cover. Right, this thing is amazing. Very limited. We're not going to print very many of this. If you miss it now, you miss it forever. And I just, uh, sorry about that. And anyways, the guy is just selling yeah. it. Hard. Well, he's been doing it longer than anybody. You know, yeah. He, he he's pretty much one of the original crowdfunding guys. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I remember hearing about it. Said this is never going to catch on. This is ridiculous. Right. You know. And you know when he was, he started in the early '90s when he did Chaos Comics out of his uh, apartment. And he had, uh, he he'd went with a, a epic. I want to say is epic, epic comics or something. Did the first issue or so of uh, Evil Ernie, but then he went out on his own with Chaos Comics, and he was shipping these things out to the direct market from his uh, apartment, and uh, he was in the top ten next to DC and Marvel, shipping them out of his freaking apartment. Yeah, well, and uh, he, like you said, he's a total package. He's he's a good right, salesman. Right. He's a good writer. 
he's, he's a good artist. You know, he, he could do it all, you know, and now he's got all the experience of, of, of yeah. business acumen. You know what I mean? And, you know, the thing that impressed me the most about that dude is when, okay, in 96 and 97, the entire market crashed. He, him and everybody else goes bankrupt. They're, it's just the market's gone. And uh, he had to survive, though. So he said, I'll sell Evil Ernie, right? And then he goes, okay, I'll sell this or that. I'll sell Chaos Comics, the, the logo. And he just kept going, but he kept Lady Death. He was like, all I need is Lady Death. And he was very much right. Every other character could be replaced, but Lady Death couldn't. And he held on to it. And uh, he went with some other publishers and stuff until crowdfunding started to take off. And he jumped back in. And the guy's as big as he was in the early 90s. Yeah. Uh, you know, surviving during a boom is easy. But surviving when your boat's sinking, that is where a real businessman you know, comes in. And that dude, and yeah. He, he does like a regular Lady Death comic. And then he'll do like a, 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 a La Morta, I think her name is. Right, right, right. And then he'll do his other character. Then he'll do, you know, it, it's, you know, he's he, he's he's regular. He's predictable in a good way, meaning he has right. you know, a schedule, and uh, you know, he, he really is like you, your boy Zach Richard C Meyer. He 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 keeps a track of him, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and tries to tries to mimic that. So we got F in the chat here says, "Where did Monk go? Is he really this shy and quiet?" I get it. I don't want to deal with anybody ever. Uh, let let me ask you, Monk. Are, are you are you introverted? Are you? Is this yeah. difficult for you uh, to talk? No, it's not difficult for me to talk. I just, you guys talk a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, true. You you really have to butt in with like elbows. It's like trying to get the discount TV on Black Friday. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm drinking coffee. He's chugging a, a big gulp over there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sorry, Monk. It, 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 you know, you got the floor. Anything you want to, anything you want to say? No, I'm just, I'm just fine listening to you guys talk about talk comics. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I sound like a fool talking about comics compared to you guys. No, no. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me ask you. Uh, you know, this is really the first time. I, I, what, what comics do you like? You know, what, what are some of your com I assume if you're, if you're at this point that you're growing up reading comics. Uh, yeah, so I grew up reading X-Men and TMNT comics. So that, those were the, the biggest influences on me. Like the first comic I got was uh, TMNT Return to New York, the first part of Return to New York. So Jim Lawson was a big influence for me. Okay, okay. So you, 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 again, I'm your oldest guy in the in the chat, which is I guess something I'm used to these days. <laughs> <laughs> and were you always drawing? Were you that kid that was covering everything? Yeah, uh, my parents said as soon as I could hold a pencil, just started drawing. Oh, cool. Did we, did you take art classes or are you just, just one of these guys who taught yourself? Um, I did take a few art classes, but mostly self-taught. Um, a lot of heavy influence. For, I worked in a tattoo shop for a long time, so oh, wow. I have a, a lot of influence from traditional tattoos, lettering, um, flowers, all stuff you need to know when you work in a tattoo shop. So that's where I learned how to do most of that stuff. My, my my buddy Jimmy just finished paying for his daughter to go through art school, and she graduated, and she moved out to Tennessee, and she's becoming a, a tattoo artist. He's just like, I wanted her to go to Manhattan and become a <laughs> head executive. <laughs> <laughs> but her, her artwork is good. So you, you've done tattoos? Uh, yeah, I've, I've done a couple. Uh, I didn't like, like I was doing an apprenticeship, and then I ultimately decided that wasn't what I wanted to do f with my future. Okay. Um, so I went into graphic design. That's what I do. Um, I, I code websites basically is what okay. I do. I was going to ask you, how do you, how do you break into tattoos? Like, how could, you know what I mean? Like, let's get the beginning guy to put a permanent piece of art. <laughs> on my <flesh. laughs> Well, you, you have to get, if you want to do it traditionally, you need an apprenticeship. Um, you can teach yourself, but that's, usually the best ways to do an apprenticeship find someone hang out at the shop and then hang out at the shop more mop the floors clean up the needles that type of stuff you aren't doing as much tattooing as you are doing the mopping the floors when you're an apprentice are, are you tattooed yourself 
Yeah, I have some tattoos. Oh, I, I, I always tell myself I'll get if if I, if I still want, I'll think about it for six months, and at the end of six months, if I still want it, I'll get the tattoo. I, I do not have any tattoos. I, I, I can't, I can't think of anything that I would want for six months. A lot of money here in tattoo. That a lot of money here in Tennessee doing tattoos. That's something I could. Gray, Gray Wolf, you're an artist, also. I don't know. I, I could see myself as the guy who sneezes doing it and messing it up and then getting beat up. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I remember once I, I, I wanted to get the Black Flag bars. Are you familiar with the band Black Flag? Yeah. yeah. They got the four bars. It's supposed to be like the waving. I was like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And I called up the tattoo parlor. This was in Albuquerque. And I, and I made it. And I walked into the tattoo parlor, sat in the chair. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember your appointment. And it was an index card held up by a Band-Aid. And something about that grossed me out. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go to my car. <laughs> <laughs> I I was going to get a tattoo back in my 20s or early, late teens or something. And um, my wife my wife had went and got a tattoo for 30 bucks, a spider on her back or something. And uh, so... I was like, I'm going to get a tattoo is from the Necronomicon uh, and which I was a big fan of like HP Lovecraft and all this. And there was this logo for one of the gods or something. I wanted to get it on my shoulder. I go, yeah. <laughs> and so I was going to go and get that tattooed on my shoulder. And uh, I was like, okay, how much would this be? And it was like $150. I was like, that's bullshit. Women get tattoos much cheaper than dudes come to find out. Really? Yeah. So I was like, oh, it's okay. they pay more for laundry. So it all works I, out. And then after that, I could never decide um, to get a tattoo. And I just wandered off after that. Which, which what were you going to get? Like the elder sign? Like, I'm just curious. Which, which... That's a, that's what I'm trying to remember is one of them. It was like, cause there was a few, there was a bunch of different ones. Um, actually, let me see which I'll, which one it was? It was one of the gray others. wolf. You said you work it on a great. If, if you have a link or something like that, uh, you know, uh, mess, message uh, message uh, Marcus Keller and he'll he'll put your links in here if you got a site or anything like that. I, I don't know. I I I, I chickened out. I, I never uh, I never went through with it. I had a fantasy at one point of this arm all like comic book tattoos, like the Superman logo, Green Lantern, Spider Man, Fantastic Four, and then in between, like in between, put like weddings and you know things like that and then in this arm i wanted to get like band logos you know because growing that that was my my two things i was into punk rock and comic books but uh i managed to go to college in the 90s and not get a tattoo so i think i was going to go to a freak show be the untattooed man yeah he went to college in the 90s he went through grunge and there's no yeah. tattoos. <laughs> well you know in oklahoma tattoos were illegal uh not having a tattoo but get like get uh tattoo shops uh couldn't be in oklahoma and uh that is interesting so we had to drive up to kansas to get six point beer and um tattoos and wow. uh so but I, I live i live just south of the kansas border like not very far so it wasn't a big deal the, the more center in oklahoma you were the, the suckier all that was because you'd have to drive hours just to go but um so we'd all go up to arc city in kansas and to get tattoos and all that type of stuff and um and at, at some point i was going to be a tattoo artist now i should never be a tattoo artist but um there was this guy and he had this whole scheme that you know uh indian reservations have different laws different state laws than the state they're in so they can have casinos and all this right. type of stuff that you can't have up so this guy I knew was working with one of the tribes to set up a tattoo parlor in Oklahoma, but on tribal land. So it would be legal. And he wanted me to be like, to run this place. And, um, but it wasn't like long after that, before he even all got set up that they just passed the law, made it legal. And it was like, well, there you go. That <laughs> was the whole, the whole scheme was the fact that this would be the only place. Yeah. You have no competition. So that ended um, any aspirations of tattoos. And then, yeah, I never did get one just because I never had something I wanted that permanent. I, I was like, oh, maybe this thing on my shoulder. And then I was like, oh, well, it's probably for the best because I would have got something stupid. 
And Marcus says no tattoos, and he's not crazy for grunge. Uh, I, I I know I know you're a grunge guy, right, Tonic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what about you, Illustrator Monk? Did, do you like uh, the old? My, my least favorite of the grunge bands is by far Pearl Jam. I, I don't know why. I that's my least favorite. Uh, I, I I just have uh, look at look at the shock look. Uh, sorry, everybody. Goodbye. Yeah. I, <laughs> grunge was something I just happened to to be there at the beginning. And this sounds awfully pretentious, but I was really into collecting records at the time, and I found out about this label sub pop you know and a couple of bands and i just started getting all these records and i remember listening listening to bleach and i'm like this this is gonna be big mm-hmm. you know and then I, I went to go see it was a uh the fluid and then it was nirvana and the open and the main line was was the melvins and i remember they did a tour and, and never mind uh yeah never mind came out during that tour and halfway through the tour the melvins switched and nirvana was the main act Right. <laughs> it was pretty overnight. And see, yeah. I was I was a little late to it, right? Because I was uh I'm just a little bit younger, so I'm 43 or something now. Um and so around the time of Nirvana, I was just like 10 years old in 1990 or something like that. So I was kind of too young. But my brother, he had one of those Columbia, you know where they sent you all the CDs? Oh yeah, the scam. Yeah. Yeah, but he actually paid for it, right? So all of us would say, give them the dollar and get 30 CDs and then just never pay again. He's the guy that actually kept paying and kept getting CDs. One of them was never mind, I want to say. And I had even, like, I live in Oklahoma, so, like, all the music I heard was, like, Johnny Cash was the closest to rock and roll I ever heard. And I really? Yeah, and and I I really didn't like hair bands or nothing like that. I don't know. I, I, never, I was never into the hair metal music. Yeah, it really it didn't appeal to me at all. But I found I was like, oh, this never. And I listened to it and I was like, son of a gun, just the screaming and all that. And I, yeah, that was so. Yeah, Nirvana was the thing that not only got me over to grunge itself, but rock. It was largely my introduction to rock and roll, uh, for the most part. And then I just got obsessed with it. And um, wow. That's funny. I mean, you take it from, I, you know, I grew up in New York. So like, we, even when I was like 15, 16 years old, I was going to CBGBs with my buddies and see. Right. So you just take it for granted that everybody in America knows knows good old rock and roll, you know? Right. Like you know? for the, my, until I was a teenager, uh, uh, preteen, like 13 or so, um, it was all, it was George Strait. I was a real big fan of uh, um, Clint Black. And uh, all that type of stuff, all the country stuff. I love that stuff. And um, and even some of the, I remember I was listening to like Meatloaf and some stuff like that. I was a little kid, so I don't know. It was just stuff I found. Meatloaf was the first album I bought with my own money. And then when CDs came out, it was the first CD I bought with the, my right. own money. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but then once, uh, once grunge came along, that was, that was pretty much it for me. And, uh, I mean, alternative music in general, you know, because, uh, yeah, big into grunge and alternative music throughout the 90s. But then I just kind of, owned, like, if I listened to music, it was just going to be Nirvana or Pearl Jam or Soundgarden or something because I'm not actively chasing it. I'm like, yeah, I just need the sound. And, uh, well, okay, uh, uh, Marilyn Manson, Korn, I got into the late 90s stuff too. But that's my 90s rock alternative and the uh the later like nine inch nails and all that and I, I um, just what harold Berg says we both have tons of seven inches from the 90s both on sub pop am rep touch yeah, yeah. I, I i i use the term fanboy to mean like sight unseen i just buy it like yeah like tonic bowl i'm i'm now a fanboy so when he makes a comic i'm getting it you know like for the longest time marvel pc whatever and then like alan moore Grant Morrison, I was fanboys of, but I was a fanboy of Sub Pop, Amrep, Touch and Go, Discord. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other other record labels, uh, Alternative Tentacles, you know, the, the, the Dead Kennedys label, all of that stuff. And then there was a couple of labels from England that had like GBH and bands like that. Oh my, uh, why can't I think of the one that had the Descendants? But all, all of those record labels. I got and I used to do Monday music on Mondays and I showed off all my seven inches and I started doing my LPs and I I, kind of, I had to go in for the, the hernia surgery and I just stopped heavy 
lifting of boxes. I, I I could do it now. I just fell out of touch, and you just reminded me, Heroin Berg. Yeah, I think I think Heroin Berg and I are, are around the same age. And he, uh, I met Meatloaf here in Manchester, Tennessee. Several. He was on his way to Nashville. Oh, <laughs> oh, Skin Yard, Jack and Dino's band. Yeah, I I, I got all, all the Skin Yard. I worked in a, a warehouse here in, in Long Island, um, Dutch East India Trading, and uh, I. Uh, just <laughs> 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 we couldn't prove it but uh one by one we all got let go but yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know you know uh, I, I never met a lot of rock like rocks uh, uh, uh musicians but one i did was this was the early 2000s uh i don't know 2008 2010 i have no idea but it was uh robbie krieger from the doors oh you met him yeah, him, his, him, and his son. Yeah, the Robbie Krieger band, right? Yeah, and they would play Doors, and he would sing the, he would take Jim Morrison's place, and uh, that was that what they toured as. And we went and saw them. He was really good at sounding like Jim Morrison, and uh, they did these great sets. And um, after the show, it was a very small show. Like this was, he wasn't on a stage. He was just on the floor, and our tables were around him. You know. Uh, at a bar or something. So, yeah, he used to play locally in the bars by me. Yeah. And so we go, I go and talk to him a little bit. This dude is so drunk and very old, right? So, you know, he's he's pretty old at this point and very, very drunk. And there's these girls. Okay, I would have been in my 20s, and I would have said, eh, I don't know how old these girls are. They might look a little young, right? But they were like groupies or something. And I was like, this is so freaking creepy. But anyways, <laughs> so I don't know if he said anything coherent because his son was just kind of holding him up or something. And I was like, man, how to to perform that well and just knock it out of the park. But then you get off stage, you can barely walk. It's like, how do you play guitar and sing, but you're, you really can't walk? <laughs> he, he knew how to stand on a stage and play guitar. Everything else out the window. <laughs> yeah, I, the Doors was like the first band that I got into. My my two older brothers were big Doors fans. Yeah, so uh, you know I inherited cassette tapes of all the Doors. How's that for all the old and cassette tapes? You know, and then and then I bought all the albums, and then I bought all the CDs. And it was funny because I used to uh, I, I got a CD player at a turntable from a buddy when I fixed up my basement, and I played Soft Parade on CD and vinyl, and hands down CD was so much better sounding. Mm -hmm. And I said that to one of my buddies, Cam. If he's listening, he's going to jump in and, and rip me a new one. But uh, CDs just sounded better than vinyl. Sorry, guys, but I, but I'm a snob and I buy vinyl now. Wait, I, I, I can. Okay, I can defend vinyl. So I, you don't have to. I'm still buying vinyl, but, but the CDs I, better. I was a huge fan of Doors, so I had the records. Um, I was buying the old records and stuff like that, and but I had the CDs as well and cds yeah the crit like they're crisper like there's there's less background noise and all this they're cleaner but it was i want to say it no it was it was morrison hotel i had on on vinyl and we listened to it you could hear people talking in the background yeah on the record that is cleaned up in so the cds yes they're cleaned up but sometimes the weird studio ambient sounds that yeah, you don't even the analog will you know you know the analog is, is is a wave so you know but the digital is here and then here drop off point so right so it, the music will sound crisper what you you know what is recorded but the and and it'll you know from this point to this point it's 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 just a drop like a skyscraper but the analog there's a wave and there's sound in that yeah that, and, that maybe wasn't supposed to be picked up but it is picked up when you hear right. it and yeah so a lot of a lot of vinyl this this is vinyl aficionado nonsense now <laughs> but a lot of guys will like that stuff because you you could hear like a, maybe a, and, a cough or, right. or, or or like a guitar like a little buzz yeah. that that's that's removed in the cd because a lot of it was like jim morrison when he'd do the and then go ah, blah, blah. Right, right. So it's the in between kind of him saying mumbling or like kind of trailing off. Now, hypothetically, 
it was probably more the mix of the CD where they go, no, this it's it's cleaner if we cut that out. But I'm like, uh, yeah, but especially with the doors, you know, the ambiance is very important. It is about chaos and all these things. Yeah. But um, anyways, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna offend people that in the chat. I, I'm gonna say that uh, without Bruce Botnick and Paul Rothschild, the engineer and producer of the Doors, they they wouldn't have made it. Like what, once Jim Morrison died, the Doors put out two more albums. Yeah, but it, it just you know. Remember, Robbie Krieger wrote a lot of the hits. He he wrote he he, he wrote Light My Fire. He he wrote a couple of the hits. But at, but without Bruce Bosnick and, and Paul Rothschild, it, those albums are. Well, this is maybe like two songs on on two albums that are, that are worth listening to. Well, it, it was really like every single person couldn't succeed alone. Like Jim Morrison was too crazy, so he needed Robbie Krieger to stand to come in and go, "Okay, I'm going to mimic your craziness with Light My Fire, but it's actually going to be a song that can play on the radio, right?" So yeah. it, it, he needed Jim Morrison needed the reins of of his friends to make his vision actually work. Uh, not everything can be the end, right? Like the end is an, a like legendary, amazing song. It's not gonna be a radio, like a radio yeah, hit. It's not a radio friendly hit, yeah. Right, right. And so Jim was a little too off the rails, but that off the rails, uh, if you spice, the, like if you use it as a spice on a pop song, you suddenly have something. And well, that was- Jim was the charismatic front man. Right. You know, and- uh I, I just remember we, I, I took a poetry class. I was my first semester in college, and I was all bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and, and I, I took this poetry class. And I, I got friendly with the teacher, and we actually, like, talked for years. Uh, he, he wrote novels, stuff. He was just a great guy to hang out with and talk after class. But we took a poetry class, and uh, he, he was he's talking about Edward Blake and all of these, you know, legit poets and and i didn't know anything so i I was all like wow and he was a cool guy and uh this one kid in the back of the class he, he had his shirt down and he had the long hair he's like what about jim morrison the greatest poet who ever existed and the, the teacher was nice he was nice and then finally one day he goes what a coincidence that the only poet you know is the greatest poet who ever existed mm -hmm. you, you know and, and he just let him have it you know <laughs> <laughs> and it was just so that kid never came back to class i was like and he was just like, maybe I was a little too mean. You shouldn't really scare kids out of class. Hey, you deserved it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and see, now, yeah, I, I really liked Jim Morrison's poet. I had the poetry books and stuff. Uh, uh, but it is one of those things, right, that uh, maybe you had to be there or something. So, you know, compared to the bigger names, writers and stuff, yeah, he was not the same thing. Uh, it, you know, but it's one of those funny things, like they had a list of the greatest guitar players of all time. And uh, like in the top five or something was Kurt Cobain. Well, yes and no. No, he... he Te technically, no, but... No, but... but like Ringo Starr, is, he's the best drummer in the world because he's in the greatest rock band of all time, but he's, he's right. basically a metronome. So, right, right, you're right. Yeah. And Kurt Cobain... It wasn't how, like, you go Jimmy Page or something, right? These guys right. going, blah, blah, blah. Eric Jimmy Page, Jimi Hendrix. Right, know. right. Yeah. But Kurt Cobain could be picked up and launched across the theater on his back and people kicking him, and he'd fall on the ground, and he would never not be able to play the best he could, right? Because right. I, I was watching something, and... You know, you have the hair bands that will do this whole thing. Well, it was Kurt Cobain lashing around as he played, right? And falling into the drums, tripping on his cord. And then he turned around and leaped backwards into the crowd. The the the, the uh, bouncer, like, grabs him and starts yanking him. He bashes the bouncer in the head with his guitar. Blood coming down the bouncer's Ooh. face. And... The bouncer punches Kurt in the back of the head and Kurt stumbles forward. One thing Kurt never did was miss. He, the guitar was just playing. Like he never missed it. He didn't fumble or play a, oh, a wrong note while all that chaos was happening. And I was like, yeah, he's not the most, he, was, he wasn't the most skilled. Well, he, was a, he was a rock and roll guitarist. Yeah. Right. But few people could hold 
to where their arms were on autopilot while his body was who knows what. And for the chat brings up the germs. Uh, I, I, I love the germs. <laughs> Darby Crash and the germs and Pat Ruth, Pat Smear and all those guys. They were so, yeah. I, and Pat Smear was the guitarist in the, uh, the, the Nirvana uh, Unplugged. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and and, I, uh, and in Utro, uh, he came in on in Utro and then oh, unplugged, and you know him on a Utro, it almost was like, Pashmir allowed Kurt to, finally reach what he was trying to do, right? Like he the sound he was trying to get, but he didn't really have, the ability to play it. So you had this in Utro, which was like just these weird loud it, it wasn't a, it wasn't even a fast album it was just loud and shrill yeah, that, I, that, to me in utro like every band has that experimental album like mm -hmm. i'm a big clash fan they got that sandinista which is a a really different album and yeah and, and now i'm realized combat rock I, I i just have to laugh at people who hear rock the casbah and uh should i stay and should i go down they they bought combat rock with with uh, Allen Ginsberg droning on and, you know, right. toilet bowl commercials in the middle, you know, it, it, what a bizarre, but, you know, but uh, In Utero, I think was the experimental Nirvana album it, and, and had it, Kurt it, not off himself. I, I wonder what the next album would have sounded right. like. It, it certainly like his attempt. I found that like, uh, this is for comic book artists or any, in, any creative type. So Kurt Cobain's goal was with In Utero was to, alienate his audience right he didn't like how poppy like how mainstream nevermind was right it wasn't the cool kids that oh well you just got to understand it it was everybody and so he wanted an album that was far far more out of the wheelhouse so that it wouldn't just be this mainstream pop hit and he did yeah, they, they started saying a few things that got on my nerves like like if, if you if you bought the cd of uh of in utro there was like 18 minutes of silence and then there was that real noisy song endless nameless like yeah like yeah the bonus and they were like well it, we're so popular that if we were to release endless nameless it would go to number one i'm like yeah you think, you're at the point now where you start to take your fans for granted that that kind right. of stuff all the day. and technically uh, I, I want to address what mags visaggio says kirk kobe was trans first off pay no mind to the to mags visaggio you know that 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 person's spotlight has moved on and <laughs> this is a person who can't accept themselves for what they are they're going to start telling other people and if you and if you misgender mags visaggio he gets all mad but then yeah. he's going to misgender kirk this is, right. this is a, a point with me that just drives me nuts and another thing i, I wish youtube would let me play music there's so many times i i, I wanted to play music in a video like a, a, an album reminded me of something mm. you know i, I want to and, and I have to agree, Bleach was the best. My my favorite Nirvana song of all time is "Dive in Me." There's something about mm. that song. I just I just love that song. I love I love the sentiment behind it. That that just boom pounding this. But a uh, negative creep is is just so yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. For me, yeah, that's hard. I guess it's what mood I'm in. It's usually in utro though. I love uh, "Territorial Pissings," and uh, that just the hardest song I've ever heard in my entire life. That is just pure screaming and sound but um do you like tad that was that was my favorite grunge band tad tad he was a big fat guy oh no i don't think Boy, i know him sweating and pausing in the middle of the <laughs> <laughs> kind of like what was it? okay oh the and i feel bad illustrated monk you, you know we, we just sit you know, leaving you hanging oh he fell asleep an hour ago i know he left <laughs> I feel bad. And anybody, if you want to join the chat, you know, and, and, and you know, we're, we're supposed to be talking about uh, the new, uh, you, you, you closing up on your campaign, but oh yeah, I got a comic. Yeah. Try to guess which band. Tat Poison Idea weighs more because I, are you familiar with Poison Idea? From I think they're from Oregon. They are the fattest bands, pound for pound. That, they never played it up. It's not like they had songs like "We'd Like to Eat." You know, <laughs> they're actually a pretty loud, raucous band. And uh, believe it or not, they all died. You know, except the, the lead singer, Pig Champion, was so fat that he had to he sat on a stool while he sang. You know, but what? Tad, Tad, they they're fatter because Tad was fat. But 
everybody in Poison Idea was fat. <laughs> you know, that's kind of the problem with like grunge bands longevity is that by like 94 95 oh most of them were dead and the survivors are now held as like oh they're the biggest ones you know like uh uh pearl jam and uh uh sound garden and foo fighters and all this stuff um they just survived <laughs> they didn't die like what um, that, that, about uh what's his name chris carnell that well, guy I, that guy was like touched by god when he was born like he's yeah hands- He's talented. He could write songs. He, man, could, he he could play guitar. Yeah, you know. And I, I, you know, back in the '90s, I was like, that guy. All he has to do to get a chick is show up. Right. You know. Oh, and and then you find out that he's depressed and kills himself. And it, 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 you know, not to get all philosophical, but you're like, what, right. what hope do the rest of us have? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, you know that was you know growing up in the '90s and stuff. Um, you know, uh, people. I'm on it, F in the chat. I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, you know, uh, people talking about like the modern influences on children. And it's like, we come from the 90s. We've seen how bad that can be, right? How the death toll of the 90s was huge. Yes. Um, yeah. And it was just because uh, it feels like in the 90s is when they started dumping on children, right? to when suddenly the world's problems was children's problems. Like I grew up to where, you know, every two weeks we'd have a seminar where they're like, hey kids, could you cure AIDS? Cause it's getting out of hand. Also the environment's collapsing and uh, oh, there's global wars you're gonna need to work on. And it's like, what? we're like in sixth grade. What the hell are we gonna do? And it's only worse now. I bet it's daily. Well, no, it's daily. Every day of every uh, every hour of every day, there's adults going, okay, kids, here's the deal. You need to fix the environment. There's a war in Israel. There's one of the Russia and the Ukraine. I don't know what you guys are going to do about it, but good luck. It's like kids don't need to hear any of that stuff because there's nothing they can do. I, and- I got to ask, am I misremembering or is this a, a conspiracy theory? Chris Cornell killed himself, right? I, I can't remember. Yeah, now now I'm starting to wonder if if the eclipse did the Mandela effect, and and I'm in an alternate reality. But yeah, he, 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 he right or or is, or is this a, you know, I yeah. I uh, I actually saw, uh, I'm trying to remember what it was. It uh, 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 the lead singer of of the Mentors, El Duce, he was being interviewed, and he said that he was offered ten thousand dollars by Courtney Love to kill Kurt Cobain. And he laughed it off as a joke. And then after that was released, El Duce got drunk and walked in front of a train. What are the odds? I love a good conspiracy theory. You know, and here's my conspiracy theory. Jim Morrison was the Lizard King and his producer was Paul Rothschild, you know, of the Illuminante fame. And Jim Morrison's father was the aircraft carrier captain that basically uh, escalated the war in, in Vietnam? Draw your own. Do, do I got to put up the yellow, the yellow tax with the ropes? You know, the lo- people who say that Jim Morrison was a psyop campaign to get get people addicted to drugs, and you know, <laughs> I don't know. But I, I don't. I'm not saying I believe it. I'm just saying that a good conspiracy theory is a lot of fun. I fa- I fact checked you. You were in fact right. Uh, Chris Cornell hung himself. Right. Yeah, I thought so. I, I after the chat mess, he ma- he manipulated my mind over here. Only <laughs> saying we die young, and then he did. Yeah, he he was a blind melon, if I remember correctly, right? Who? Lane Stanley. Oh, right, right, yeah. yeah that was blind melon. Another guy. All he had to do was show up. Back in the nineties, right? The picture of success was chicks. Right, you know, and, Chris Cornell. That guy, all that guy had to do was open up the door, turn on the light, and I, you know, I, I'm just sitting here talking to a girl, and the girl's like, "What? Where did I go?" Where'd right, I go? Right. <laughs> it, yeah, it's between like it was either heroin overdoses or suicide, like almost all the major bands, and and then the Gits, which I I really liked a lot too. She was just murdered by yeah, Mia Zapata. I was in yeah. Seattle like a week after that happened, and I just there was like graffiti everywhere. Mia's yeah. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. El, El Duce outlived Gigi Allen by four years. No Lane. St- oh, Lane Stanley was in Allison Chains. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the guy from Blind Melon was was it was heroin. 
Lane Stanley. Yeah. And Lane, the sad thing about Lane Stanley, now that I'm remembering, is is he laid there for weeks because he was like known to be reclusive or whatever. Mm. And you know, they they only like called him up to like, hey dude, are we gonna you know work on right? poor poor you know, you never know what somebody else is going through. Yeah. And there's another thing I'm gonna say. Gigi Allen died in '94, and that was the end of punk rock. Punk rock. That yeah. was the that was the you know, I don't you know. Green Day, all of these guys, you're not punk. You're not yeah, punk. No. Yeah. When GTL, Wait, yeah. This is your most controversial statement yet. Yes. Oh, well, my subs my subscriber count just went down. <laughs> That's right. You had some Green Day fans up in here. Now, okay, I'll tell you like, what. I got I got I got all the Green Day records, but then when they started insulting the average American, not a good strategy. Yeah. Not a you're personable, John's long box. You'll get to ask because you're good with people. I think you're good at cons. We can talk. You're plus. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I've, uh, I've, I've been, the past three days, I've been getting a lot of good news and a lot of good encouragement. Uh, I, believe it or not, I got like a little, like, like depressed. Like, oh my God, my comment's going to bomb. Uh, you know, what am I doing? Who, who am I to think? And then the past three days, unbeknownst, I didn't reach out. I didn't do a pity party. And people have been, been, uh, been uh, nice to me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Trust Wikipedia if you want to live. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like two weeks. Yes, yes. We're talking about the singer from Alice in Chains. Yeah. I, thank you for all the engagement in the, in the chat. I, I love when the chat gets going. We, we got a hot topic, Tactonic. Well, nobody wants yeah. to talk comics anymore. Let's talk music. Yeah, we're talking because comics suck. Yeah, and right. unfortunately, I got to put this stupid link in here to, to remind you that it's about comics. <laughs> That's right. Oh, okay. Yeah. My, uh, my friend, speaking of Green Day... My friend had a, a cassette tape that he recorded. I don't know. Anyways, one side was Green Day and the other side was uh, um, Offspring. Okay. And, and I would listen to it and flip it over. And so for the longest time, I didn't know who Green Day versus Offspring was. Like I knew. They were the same band. I know it was one or the other. I didn't know which one specifically. But um today i do know the difference so that's pretty cool it's it's funny i go through phases with music lately i've been into a heavy metal phase and i've been you know uh i, I got pandora on my on my phone and i listen you know sometimes at work i'll do like repetitious work and you don't really you know you got to do the same thing a thousand times so i put in and i, and I listen to music and i've been i've been discovering bands new to me you guys are gonna laugh bands like freedom hawk and, and cadaver oh my god i uh big business is another band but then i just was like yeah i'm tired and that's the way it is with me i'm tired it's not that i dislike them but it's a new phase so today right. I, you know what i'm gonna listen to the buzzcocks again yeah i just put on the buzzcocks and oh my god i was in such a good mood and then <laughs> and then after the buzzcocks i played every every song i could think of i, I was like i'm gonna listen to never mind the bollocks i haven't listened to yeah. that album the sex pistols that is one of the greatest albums ever recorded. I I, I love that. I love that album. It's it's raw. It's crunchy. You know, it's angry. It to me that is the definitive punk rock album. You, know, I, I, you say I hate those bands. W which bands were you talking about? Not the Buzzcocks. And, and, no, no. It, it, he had to be talking about Green Day and oh, Offspring. Green, I, Offspring, I'm not crazy about. They got they got a, like one or two catchy songs. I ne I never got in, into them. Green Day. I took it a little personal after I bought like four or five of the albums, recorded it, gave cassette tapes to friends. This band is good. You get to get it. To, they were like a gateway punk band. And then, and then like a year ago, they, they stopped making fun of the average American. I don't know. Yeah. I, yeah. And, and see, don't insult your fan base. I will admit when you buy heroic tales, I will love you forever. I will love you <laughs> right. long time. The customer is <laughs> always right. No, um, with like with uh, offspring, they wrote one song and then just change the lyrics for it for the rest of their career. Like so, the Ramones. Right. I, I, I read a review for the Ramones. They said, uh, uh, and basically ACDC, somebody said the same thing about ACDC. It's it's the same song written over and over and over right. again. And then uh, uh, Joey Ramone said, yeah, but when you were perfect the first time. <laughs> I, think, I think Everclear said something the same thing. You know, they were like, because then it's not even vaguely disguised. Like, when they're when an Everclear song, Everclear song starts, you don't know which one it is because it's going to be identical. Everyone is one, two, three. 
And then you start singing the wrong song. Oh, <laughs> oh God, maybe look like an idiot. <laughs> and uh, oh, guys, I will tell you this. Here's one of my toxic traits. I will judge you by if you like the Ramones or not. If you don't like the Ramones, I, I'll still be friends with you. I'll plea put, but I won't trust your musical taste. I'm not saying you got to buy all their records. Look at Tonic Bowl. He's like, I don't like the Ramones. <laughs> <laughs> they are just like a good, fun band that like, like you drive it in the car and the Ramones come on. You just like, mm. you don't even realize it, but you're like, the sky just got a little bluer, you know? Well, you know, okay. That's probably my problem, right? So, you know, everybody's like Ramones, that's real punk, right? And I'm like, I mean, they fit to me. They felt like the green day of their era, right? To where, hey kids, is the Sex Pistols like too violent and scary for you? Well, yeah, the they're, they're the safe punk band. I do agree with you. Yes, it's pop, it's pop music, but I would agree that yeah, just like Green Day, especially Green Day's like early years and stuff. I mean, you're not going to change the channel even if you go, ah, eh, I'm not totally into them. But I mean, it's good pop music. It's good pop rock music and stuff. And um, so yeah, I think my early years, it was kind of like you and Ninja Turtles, to where at the time it was all grunge and stuff. So you know, people going, oh, the Ramones. And I'm like, this sounds like pop music, you sissies. Wait, this was on a movie soundtrack? What type of sellout does that? And, and so, the funny thing about the Ramones is my favorite album is the Phil Spector one with, uh, you know, right, <laughs> that's right. overproduced and everything. <laughs> it's just glory. I love the story that he, he held them at gunpoint until they, 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 they hit the notes <laughs> that he wanted to hit. It was all fun and games until he actually shot that woman. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Come to find out he wasn't bluffing. Yeah. Oh, it's a good thing they, they hit the they hit the notes. <laughs> Rock and roll. I I, yeah, I, was at, I went to go. My, my cousin was the trombone trombone player for the Voodoo Glow Skulls, and I was living in Albuquerque. And he would, they would stop and they would stay at my house and they would bring bands by. And uh, so when they were in New York, I just happened to be in New York visiting my family, and we went to go see the Voodoo Glow Skulls, and they were playing with, with uh, I forget who they were playing with. But the Ramones were there. I have never saw the Ramones play live, but Joey Ramone was there. So he introduced me. He's like, oh, my, my cousin. So I'm, I'm meeting Joey Ramone. And he was like, eh, yeah. And it was funny because after we were in this oval-shaped bar, and the guy has that overly wide four-foot-long broom, and he's just sweeping. And he goes around the bar in an oval, and then boom, stops at Joey Ramone's feet. And Joey Ramone's just looking at the broom. <laughs> His girlfriend pulls him to the other side of the bar. You know, and then the guy continues sweeping, and then boom, puts him in the back of the feet. And Joey Bones like, oh. <laughs> I don't remember what we were talking about, but I was just watching. Joey Bones couldn't figure out what to do when the when the when the when broom hit his feet. <laughs> Kids you know, these days are effed up. Um, <laughs> as a fifty-six-year-old man with no children. I have to agree, but then again, also get off my lawn. So, right. But what we got thirty-two people on the chat. What what do kids listen to? Is there alter? Is there alternate music? Like you know, oh, yeah. my, I I have fifty-five nieces and nephews. I'm one of seven yeah. kids, and I'm the only one in my family that, that doesn't have five kids. And my nieces and nephews are up to five kids. So, like when we have a family get together, it's 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 we can't fit in anybody's house. Yeah, they all listen to classic rock. They, they, they listen to like, you know, they used to bust my chops about my record collection. Now all my nieces and nephews come over, they're like, oh, Uncle John, I didn't know you were cool. Like, <laughs> right. What, what do they listen to? Like, I, uh, I, yeah. I, I like modern rap. It's just terrible, you know. Uh, well, you know, yeah, and it depends on like what demographic. Now, the, the, the demographic that was us is listening largely to the same thing. And there was a lot of talk throughout like the early 2010s about... Like my daughter, she for a little bit listened to like Britney Spears or whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden was listening to Nirvana, Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson and She's all that. She's in her 20s now, right? Did yeah, she, she, uh, she's 24. Okay, yeah. And so now a lot of them are going back to <clears throat> grunge and punk and uh, stuff from the 80s and 90s. Um, so there's a bit of a resurgence to where they're just recycling Gen X. Uh, music, but you know, I mean, it's not so much 
it's not all that different from in the 90s how much people were listening to Jimi Hendrix and The Doors, right? And so, uh, and you know, and what I'm listening to now is uh, I listen to only only my 90s music for the longest time, and then uh, just the past like five years or so, I started to uh, listen to 2010s. It it was about from 2010 to 2015. There was like an alternative rock resurgence. It was just new bands and stuff. And uh, there's uh, bands like, uh, well, the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs kind of led it. And what happened was I wanted to listen to the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, which I've liked for a long time. And I put it into Spotify. Yeah, Spotify. I just typed in Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. And they started playing music around that time period. And, uh, oh, I discovered like dozens of these bands. I was like, man, that's really good. Like Metric. I can listen to any like any album of by metric i can listen to the whole thing no skipping right just every song i'm like man that's good and it's it's weird music because they did have their entirely different yeah. sound and even though it was based in alter, uh, alternative um they they uh oh you know and some of them it was sub pop to some degree you know they were there uh they were the record labels of some of these but like um I don't know if you ever heard of the uh, Postal Service. Um, they're another one that was in the era. Uh, and, and it's weird because it's, it was kind of a hybrid of uh, pop music with a lot of uh, kind of digital music, right? It wasn't nearly as just, you know, guitar, bass, and drums. But it had a lot of influence of that. Anyways, I listened to a lot I of that. I say Heroinburg... I don't even know what you're saying. It's it, it's all derivative, imitative, mumble rap, vaporwave synth. I, I I feel like a grandpa over here. Like you kids with your raps and your <laughs> yeah. I don't know what all that business is. <laughs> I, I, we have a young apprentice at my job, but he brings a Bluetooth speaker, and when he puts on music, I'm like, I, I and I don't want to be that old guy that's like yeah music, but he puts it on. It, it sounds like a a, a drill. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, there's a like, possibility. Is that the drill or is that your music? You know, there's a possibility he just has terrible taste in music. Yeah, I know, but I'm like, I, I used to hate when the old time because, because yeah, <laughs> put on Zen Arcade in front of your dad by Who's Could Do. Yeah, that was the old. My father was pretty pretty lenient when it came to music, but anytime I put on Zen Arcade by 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 Who's Could Do, my father would like. What are you listening to? Music is so beautiful. This guy is just screaming, you know. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah. I can't argue with you. So, well, you know, so I, I don't want to be that guy, but like, you know, I'm like. My parents were George Strait. Like, that was it. That was the beginning and end. Like, Reba McIntyre, George Strait, Dolly Parton. So, yeah, they hated. Like, yeah, Nirvana was, that is screaming. And then Marilyn Manson, what's that? That's creepy like they hated all the music i listened to um but my friend's dad he, he to the day he died that punk elvis that punk elvis he would, he would get so mad <laughs> <Come on. laughs> oh there's this there's this cartoon that i forget the name of in the early 2010s back when being super offensive was like really popular and now everybody forgot that every that was really popular and pretend like it wasn't there yeah, was this little there was this cartoon and it was this asian guy who was angry at bill or uh, angry at elvis presley because he blamed him for the death of bean crosby and like he travels to where elvis's grave is or whatever and pisses on it and it's like i piss on you elvis presley you kill bean crosby anyways that's the entire story <laughs> just the cartoon i saw i still think offending people is popular uh, i i i don't i don't know I, it, it seems like I, I i don't know how to respond to that because i i i, I see things like like offensive and it doesn't bother me. Like you have to let things bother you. You know what I mean? Like right. when I when I like the like the 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 big offensive thing is this that that British guy Sam Shepard coming out. I'm like he's just a fat slob in, in lingerie. Like to me, I just want to laugh at him. I can't be offended right. by it. It's, it's just it's stupid. You know. But I, I don't. 
But uh, uh, person, like you, if you were truly offensive, like the Sex Pistols, if they came out now, I think people would be like, you know, f the Queen, you know, you know. God. They they were offensive at their time and continue to be. And honestly, offensive things are generally always offensive. And you know, I see a lot of people go, "Well, you couldn't do that nowadays." It's like, yeah, you could. Did you think it was like acceptable then? No, it wasn't acceptable then. That was what made it cool. But it's whether you're in the group that thinks it's cool, right? So the things Kurt Cobain did would be just as offensive and outrageous today, right? Uh, taking a picture with a gun in his mouth or whatever, right? Yeah, I had people, that hanging up in my room, you know? Yeah, people would not today think, oh, well, that's cool. No, it would be just as offensive now as it was then. And I think a lot of things are like that, um, you know, where people act like all of a sudden mainstream society is uptight. It's like, no, no. no. Back, it's like, back in the 70s when I was a kid, I remember my father and mother, like, getting mad. You don't listen to this band. and Right. You know, you know I, I'm trying to think of examples. But there, there was some pretty offensive stuff. Like, uh, no, I, I can't even remember. Like, Black Sabbath, you know. Right. You, you didn't listen to Black Sabbath. That was devil music, you know. Right, I mean? right. You know, and uh, I remember we couldn't see the Who because there was that stampede in in Chicago, and like fourteen people died. You know, and like, mm -hmm. you know, my 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 brother had had tickets to see the Clash and the Who, and at the time they were my two favorite bands. They were playing in, in Shea Stadium in New York, and I had the ticket in my hand, and I was walking to the station wagon to go, and then my father said, "No, John's too young. You guys can get stampeded to death mm -hmm. all you want, but John's too young. <laughs> so I, I never got I never got." And I want to address Marcus Kellegrew over here. I I love Elvis. I've always loved Elvis. I always mm -hmm. thought Elvis was cool. I'm talking slim Elvis in the white suit. The, the, you can't compare. That guy was charisma personified. And then I have to say underrated Nick Lowe. Absolutely. I, I was just listening to Nick Lowe the other day. I, I knew my heavy phase was over and a new phase because Nick Nick Lowe did a lot of pro producing for, for, uh, for punk bands. But he also had like a '50s revival aesthetic. Him and Nick Lowe and Rock Pile and bands like. So I I knew a change was coming. Yeah. I didn't listen to those bands. Ozzy was Satan. My, I I couldn't bring in Beatles records because uh, my grandfather was an IRA guy, you know, uh, and the British. So my mother was like, "No, nah, they're British. We, we're Irish in this house. We we don't support anything British." I was like, <laughs> "I'm buying Strawberry Fields, Mom. I'm sorry." <laughs> <laughs> and Kiss. I, I remember, like, back in second grade, for me, second grade, you know, Kiss was, like, super popular, and that was kids in Satan's service, you know. The, right. I was, we were a church-going Catholic school family. You know, I went to Catholic school. So, you know. You know, my... I my before I finally admitted I liked Kiss because I felt so evil. My, my grandma, and, you know, people forget about this, you know, when they talk about the modern era. Well, if you live where I live... This feels very familiar. When I was a kid in the late 80s, um, me and my cousin, um, we liked He-Man, obviously, because that's the thing to like. And um, I would, my family wasn't very religious at all. I don't, like, I don't know what my parents' religion is to this day. Like, they just don't talk about it. I don't know. They're agnostic or something. Maybe my dad is Christian. I really don't know. He won't talk about it. So, <laughs> anyways... So I, they, know, I respect that religion is supposed to be a personal thing. Like my yeah. wife and I will talk, but like at work, I don't, you know, it's, it's right. Not a, yeah. And he just, so they just let me kind of run wild with whatever they didn't care. And, uh, uh, but my grandma, very, very like evangelical religious. So I, but, but my cousin lived with my grandparents. So whenever me and him would go and hang out, um, we would play with our Star Wars figures, and he always had like he always had like more toys than me. But they because they always went to garage sales, so he would get all the good deals on He Man and Star Wars from garage sales and stuff. Anyways, but my grandma was clearly bipolar, so like her evangelicalism would like wane and then all of a sudden spike out of nowhere. So they, uh, my grandma and aunt, they just had this evangelical like mental. Oh, and they took all of his He-Man, took him out to the trash can, put him in it, and set him on fire. Well, He-Man is satanic. I mean, right. He briefs, you know, and, and well, a little Betty Page haircut. 
he was watching he was watching the cartoon and they heard he man say i'm the master of the universe and they said nah -uh, jesus is and they burnt his toys and made him watch as they burned them i've never seen something or now i wasn't there when it happened but i never heard of something so sadistic and like yeah. sociopathic like you have to have a mental disorder to do something like that and so you know nowadays and it's funny you know when we were kids or we, uh, in the 80s with dungeons and dragons it was satanic now it's racist it don't matter if you're calling dungeons and dragons racist or satanic you're the same group of people right yeah. you're, you're the church ladies uh yeah it doesn't it doesn't matter why you hate harry potter right it's the fact that you see harry potter and dungeons and dragons as all the ills of mankind it's, it's, it's all that's church the problem I, I, right I, I can't believe i lived long enough to hear johnny rotten of the sex pistols say that the punk rockers now are the republicans you know <laughs> right. the, the conservatives are the counterculture and you know and, and donald trump is the biggest punk rocker going now of course johnny rotten likes to say things just to get a, a response so i don't know how much he believes it uh, but like, right like, but oh, all the progressives the, are the church ladies. You know, they, they tell right. them to cover up in video games. Forget mm -hmm. about it. Can you, can you imagine right. how the those getting a look at saving the world? <laughs> right. And, and see, the point The point isn't the truth of what he says. It's the fact that he knows that's what you say to get that same offended response, to say right. that conservatism or uh, the right is the new, you know. And, um, and but I mean... Uh, that is that, like my group of friends who've always been habitual line steppers, right? We, whatever line is drawn, that's what we cross. We don't care what that line is. It's just, that's what you cross. Um, it's, it, it changes. And the biggest, the biggest, uh, the biggest danger is when people think that the line is never going to move, right? Because I see so many people going, but we were supposed to be on the left. It's like, no, we're supposed to be against whatever it is. And if evangelicalism ramps up and old ladies are burning little kids' action figures because they're satanic, we got to be against that. But right. if a blue-haired lady like Tipper Gore back in the 80s is trying to censor rock, that's what we got to be against. You, we have to know, attack that, every enemy. That people forget that... that Al Gore's wife, Tipper Gore, started that PMRC and wanted to censor rock and roll. Yeah. You know, and then and then I'm watching Al Gore dance awkwardly to Fleetwood Mac when Bill Clinton became president. I'm like, wasn't this right. – didn't Jello by offer go on tour talking about how horrible the Democrats were, that they were going to censor rock and roll? Right. You know, and, and, and then you, you fast forward and you have uh, – who's the vice president? Right uh, now? Yeah. Harris? Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris. They go, what's your favorite rap music? Because she's like semi dark skin. So, of course, she listens to her hard gangster rap. And she goes, right. Tupac. And right, because that's the first name she can remember. Yeah. And uh, I was like, years ago, that, that's like about as relevant as me saying Bing Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bing Crosby. He's a real, <laughs> he's a real hard nose. Uh, but I, I found that crazy, right? Because that's just like Johnny Rotten that was the thing to say but for a straight laced person who wants to fit in to say tupac i'm like didn't he get arrested for him and his friends gang raping a woman that that is this you know that's this and but when i was a kid it was the same thing but different right it was like if you were on the good side of society nothing you did could be bad and if you were on the other side nothing was right I, I want to address this comment. I was, uh, F in the chat says, I used to be left. Now the right makes more sense. The first time I voted for a president, I voted for Ralph Nader, Green Party. The second time I voted, I, it was Bill Clinton. And I don't think my views have changed. Yeah. Well, you know, you know they say that, you know, when you're young, when you're below 30, if, 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 if you're not a liberal, you have no heart. And if, you know, if you're above 40, you're not a conservative, you have no brain. I, I really don't think anything changed. Show ID to vote. You know, how mm -hmm. controversial is that? You know, let's let's have mm -hmm. elections that we that, that, that we could monitor. You know what I mean? Like they, yeah. They, 
the the IRS could come after me for every penny that I make, even crowdfunding, but but they can't, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm doing my taxes right now. You know, my wife is an no. immigrant. I pay. We pay. I, I keep joking to my wife. I paid five thousand dollars for you, honey. You better clean those dishes. You know. <laughs> That's you know. right. You're expensive. <laughs> yeah, the you, most expensive property well, I, I own. I'm not going to sign that green card again, and you're going to go back. You know? <laughs> you know, so, but I, I'm still that same guy. And, and it's funny because I remember when I voted, I was living in Albuquerque, and we voted. And then I was just like, today is Constitution Day. We're going to ex exercise all our rights. So we, we went and we voted, and then we drove out to the desert. We were shooting guns. You know what I mean? And this was we, – we were voting for left-wing Democrats, you know, right. shooting guns, having a good old time. And we forget that Bill Clinton had – the Confederate flag, Clinton Gore, you right. know, in, in nowadays, oh, oh. You know, and, you, you and I love when all the people like, oh, Confederates, oh, that, the other day they were like, oh, yeah, well, well uh, celebrating the day that the, uh, the, the, the good people beat the, the, the bad people, like, so, yeah, I'm celebrating the day the Republicans beat the Democrats, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, <laughs> you, you know, and it's, it's weird, it was, that's one thing that's weird about, um, you know, growing up in Oklahoma, um, you know, things change over time. Well, the, the Confederate flag was called the rebel flag here by the, like in the eighties. Uh, yes. Yeah, it was the rebel flag. It, it from was, the seventies. Yeah. It, it changed and if, the name if rebels are cool. Yeah. If you saw a rebel flag sticker on a guy's pickup, it meant he smoked weed and was an alcoholic, right? He was a rebel <laughs> and it was, and they also, they, it was the outlaw flag. It right. was I break the law, and hence the the rebel flag on the top of the uh, uh, General Lee. It wasn't really the Confederacy. Right. At the, at that point, that flag had been repurposed as I break the law and the government sucks. Right. right. It was it was anti government. And, I think um, it's the same thing is the don't tread on me flag now. Right. Uh, that's exactly right. That, that, uh, that removes all the baggage. Right. Right. And 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 it's weird because. It was kind of the reverse thing where like the don't tread on me that's an that's an american flag that was for our uh fighting against britain and stuff but then yeah over time it just became this controversial thing you're not gonna let the government tread on you it's like well no i i just want to address this uh harold berg did I, I didn't know you did all this cool stuff he, he did an event for Jell and Xine. Xine Savenka is the singer of X. And X, just to, just an X, is the name of the band. One of my favorite bands in the world that I still, I'm amazed didn't get as po didn't get as popular as they should have. I just just wanted to shout out for X, one of my favorite bands. And I think I've seen Xine solo. I've seen John Doe solo. I've seen the Knitters. I've never seen X. One of my favorite bands. The lines have been redrawn lately. The parties are reshuffling. Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. And and I mean, we can see that kind of like you mentioned earlier, where uh, the Southern Democrat versus the Northern uh, Republican. Now, back then, Republicans were the, the liberal party and the Democrats were the conservative. Hence why, like, you, uh, the people didn't move, right, from one side of the country. The parties moved but the people stayed the same and so and we've seen this happen multiple times because yeah democrats were the southerners for slavery and then by the 1960s they were the northerners for like civil rights right all of a sudden it's it's just like corporations remember they filibusted civil rights and then it, even in the 70s the, the Republicans had to push in, and I can't remember the name of the act, to force unions to take minorities. Like mm -hmm. we always talk about the, the, the unions pretty much formed to, to, to keep the industrial. I'm a, I'm a big union guy. But the, yeah. the unions pr pretty much blocked out all minorities. Right. You know, and, and it was 1972. I forget the, 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 Pit, the Pennsylvania Act, I think it was called, something like that basically said we're going to crush the unions unless mm -hmm. you start making and now all of a sudden all the democrats oh yeah we love the minorities the union right now they're a big and you know and that's a there's so many interesting things with like i think that people getting too into politics is very uh oh my god just just today i had to go wire up uh, a steam fitter trailer you know when the trailers show up we wire them up so they can have air conditioning and stuff like that and we are electricians we do that 
I'm I'm whispering like he's ever going to see this. But the guy came over and it was the whole time I'm wiring it up. It's just politics. And I'm yeah. Like, Do you want to talk about my comic book? I'm making a com- like I just anything. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, let's talk about anything else. You know, I, and I agreed with the guy, but it's like, dude, it, it, yeah. it just wears on my soul. Yeah, you start getting chest pains and stuff. Yeah. How often can we just talk about politics? Like, there's no good guys, you know. Right. None of them are good guys. No, none of them are on my side, you know. The Republicans could go screw themselves. The Democrats could go screw themselves. But at least the Republicans don't want children to take, like, irreversible <laughs> right. It's It's sad that it has to be deliberate for them to go, okay, which do you want? Nightmare fuel or kind of the nightmare fuel? It's like, no, neither. Can we have... Well, is who, there a- who's going to step on my balls the least? <laughs> the reason, who's going to stomp my groin into a yeah, mud one, one of them is going to stomp on my groin, and one of them is going to wear like a high heel. and then. <laughs> yeah, they're going to... They're going to stomp I, I, I on it. I the Indians were savages. You know, the... Uh, I, you know... You know, and 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 now everybody forgets half the population of Ireland came to America as slaves too. You know, like we, we don't we don't teach you know elephants and asses screwing the masses. That's <laughs> that Tonic Ball, I I mean Illustrator Monkey, you still there? What what music do you listen to? We I kind of got so engrossed in this conversation. Yes, I'm I'm still here. I'm I'm um, sorry for neglecting you. I feel like a bad host. Um. Okay, I, I guess I have to say that I like the Ramones, and I don't like Green Day. Mm-hmm. You don't um, like Green Day? That's fine. That's fine. Um, they alienated some, people. Some musicians that can listen to anything they put out, I would say Tom Waits. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Frank Zappa or Buddy Guy. I can listen to anything they put out. It's great. Oh, good, good musicians. I, I Tom Waits got me through a real bad period of my life, you know, and as my college roommate used to say, that that Cookie Monster guy. <laughs> I, I I I'll never forget. I I moved to Albuquerque, and I I found a record store, and the record store was brand new. And I just walked in, wandering, looking through the albums, and they were playing Tom Waits, and I didn't know Tom Waits at the time. So this is like '93. So they're playing Tom Waits. I'm trying to remember what was that album. That- and I was like, who is it? I've never heard it. And full on punk rocker walking in and they're listening to Tom Waits. And it was completely new. And I was like, I start a conversation. And the guy goes, hey, after after work, you know, when the store closed down on Fridays, we have parties. You want to hang out? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know anybody. Like, I'm literally in Albuquerque for a week. And now I'm hanging out with the cool guys that own the record shop. You know what I mean? All right. This is so Friday comes, I show up. Hey, John, well, they play more Tom Waits. These sexy girls, every these goth chicks. You know, they look like you drew them, Illustrator Monk. These girls are beautiful. And one by one, they're going into the back room, and they're not coming out. I'm like, okay, it's the hookup room. That's the hookup room. I, I would love to go to that. You know, I'm single. I'm new to town. I'd love to go to the hookup room. I want to go to the hookup room. And then uh, one by one, and it's me and one guy. This guy just had this crazy hair, insane, and we were just having this frantic conversation about music. He's like, "Yeah, hey, I'm gonna go in the back room. You want, you want to go?" And I'm like, "Is, is you know, is he hitting on me? Like, what's going on? You know?" But the hookup room, like, like, am I gonna go back to? Is it just gonna be like naked bodies just melted onto each other? You know, I'm like, "Yeah, you know what? It's time to new to town." Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And I'm, I'm like, "This is gonna be awkward," but I, I couldn't resist, you know. And I go back there. They're all doing heroin. Everybody's laying on the floor, needles in their arms. And he's just like, yeah, you know, they tap. I'm like, I'm out. I'm out. You know, and he's like, that's cool. And I just was like, listen to a record by myself. I slowly, I slowly let myself. And, I, and those guys, I was in Albuquerque for seven years. Every one of those guys died. You know, that I, yeah, I like to think that that was the day I dodged the biggest bullet in my life. Because I have no willpower. I can't stop collecting comics. You know what right. I mean? I, I never smoked because I knew I would never stop. That that would have been the day I died, you know. So, how, how's that illustrate? I ask you to talk and then I tell a story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a bad host. I apologize, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I guess there was. Yes, back. This was like, uh, uh, what, what was the name of that movie? Uh, John Travolta, Uma Thurma. Uh, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction just came out, and then I just moved to 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 uh, Albuquerque, and 
the first person, literally the first person I ever met was this Indian woman. She was a lot older and we're hanging out talking. I'm like, wow, I'm making friends with Indians, white guy from New York. You know, and look how liberal I am. And she she invites me to her dorm room and I'm like, yeah, it's, she's a MILF. You know, I go in there, she's freaking naked, laying on the ground with a needle sticking out of her arm. Uh-huh. I was like, heroin's a real, like I just saw it in Pulp Fiction. It, it, it was bad in Albuquerque in 93, you know? And then, like you said, all of these musicians started dying. I, you know, I, I, I dodged that. I dodged, I, you know, I, I've never been much of a joiner. I've always been this, you know, this is what I like. This is what I don't like. And I'm not doing, you can't talk me into, my wife tried to talk me into doing a lot of things. And I, I'm an asshole, you know, I don't. Do <laughs> I've never seen Tom Waits. I saw Tom Waits at Fifth Avenue Theater in Seattle in 1999. I think it was the best concert I ever saw. He was kicking up so Yeah. I, 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 you know, he's an old man now. I would have liked, I got to correct the late 80s doing shows for bands from New York. You could always count on the uh, needles littering the dressing room. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I remember I was working on the George Washington Bridge d- during all of COVID. You know, so I, yeah, everybody else, I, I guess I was essential, which I think is the meanest thing. In, everybody's job is essential to them. So I never stopped working. I was working on a three-man crew, you know, maintaining the George Washington Bridge. And we would come off the bridge at the end of the day, and there would literally be just people just sitting there with, with needles sticking out of their own. We had a porta party installed for us, and we literally would have to go in there with a flashlight. Like, you're, you're like, oh, because you're holding it in. Because it's January, you're on the George Washington Bridge, you're freezing. You don't want to use a porta potty, but you have to sometimes. The, you go in there and you're like ready to just do your business, and you you're looking for needles. No, you know it's it, it was oh yeah. So, her, yeah, heroin's a, a damn thing. Oh, I guess it still is. You know, I I I don't know. Well, yeah, they have a the fentanyl and all that type stuff. Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's fentanyl. I because I, I remember when I first started going to college, it was cocaine was the drug of choice, mm-hmm. and and then it, and then it just became heroin. And I was like, you know, I, at the risk of offending people, I tr- I tried cocaine, and I was like, this is so good, never give this to me again. <laughs> right, right. Then I knew I I would never. So I did it once. I was like, ah, ah. I was like the life of the party. I, I was like hit on three girls and girls were giving me their phone number. I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. I can never do this again. Like, <laughs> right. The second time that would have been the end. Now I did everything a lot for like six or seven years. Like when I was 16 to 20 or something like that. But, um, uh, but it was that whole, oh, you see, you see, you, you, I think once you get out of your teens, you start to see, you either see how horrible it all is, or you're never getting out of it. And so I, I was never addicted to anything, so I just stopped doing it. Well, but but then when I was a little I bit old, personality type, I know I would not stop. Right. I I hurt my I hurt my back or something much later, like in my twenties, and they gave me these uh uh. It was like oxycodone or something like that for my back pain. Well, I had a weird, because uh, I hadn't slept in like three or four days. I just couldn't. And the doctor gave me that, and I took that pill. And it, it's supposed to make you relaxed and go to sleep. But my, chem, my brain chemistry did the opposite. And I was just like, I'm a golden god. And like <laughs> the next, I, I didn't sleep because it worked as, it worked opposite of how it's supposed to. So like, The next day I went back to the doctor. I said, I feel too good. Take these away from me. Yeah. Just, and he, he ended up giving me these giant ibuprofen pills and I took one of those and it worked perfectly. And I was like, why the hell would you give me like a narcotic? Why do you go right to, right to 11? Why give me a narcotic when ibuprofen just, it was just four pills put into one. I, I, F in the chat. I told you that story. <laughs> I, I, I told that story on the camera. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I remember I got I got a root canal and I got it done on a Saturday and I, I didn't want to I didn't want to take off work, so I got a root canal, and I, I for the same reason you said I don't take painkillers or anything like that, you know, because God knows, you know what I mean. I could deal with pain. I could deal with pain. I, I, you know, they they did the numbing for the root canal, of course. I'm not a crazy person, and then the doctor's like, oh, you want codeine you want a prescription for codeine and i was like no he goes well you're gonna need it and he wrote it and he gave it to me and i was polite 
And as we walked out, I crumpled it up and threw it in the garbage. You know what I mean? I didn't even want to be tempted with it. So now I'm. it's Monday, and I'm telling that story to my partner at work. And, and I'm like, yeah, it's not that bad. You know, I got the root canal. And he's like, oh, my God, I had to take off days of work. I'm like, no, it's not that bad. It's just pain, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he gave me a prescription for Cody. <laughs> this carpenter jumped off a ladder like Spider-Man right in front of me. You got that prescription? You got to, I'll give you $10 bill. I, got, I was like, no, nah, I crumpled it up and threw it away. He goes, can you get it? <laughs> right. No, you know, and, and right. I was like, this is "Why I don't want this prescription?" <laughs> they, uh, yeah, I don't want to be the guy jumping off of a freaking. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah, he, he was just like, and, and they escorted him off the job. He ended up, he was like doing stuff, and I'll never forget. They escorted him off the job, and he sent his girlfriend to, to pick up his personal tools. Va 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 boom! This girl, <laughs> it, 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 I, I, do you remember the banana splits cartoon? Is it or not? As a kid, the sour grapes girl would come in and she would like go like that. No, like, that's what it was like. This girl just came, boom! It was it was as if you would an illustrator monk drew a girl, <laughs> this girl you two could draw, and boom, 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 boom. Every eye was just looking at her. I'm like, that's why he's selling the drugs to keep keep this thing. <laughs> Ladies love drug dealers. <laughs> Uh, uh, what does he say? Pain makes you heal more quick. I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, drugs make you dead more quickly. Mm -hmm. you know, they have that people, effect. A couple of people in my family, uh, uh, my nephew, he, he he got prescription drugs and on the railroad, coming home from work, found him, found him dead on the train. Three three young kids. What a, what a freaking shame. And uh, my high school buddy, my high school buddy was, was like, Chris Cornell, good looking, talented. He could play any instrument, charming. You wanted to be his friend. Matt, like, this was like, I, I was like, I want to be his friend. Like, I, I, I calculated on how, because that's how charismatic this guy was. Now he's homeless. He's a homeless doing what he's got to do for, for the next drug fix, you know, to the point when every once in a while you'll, you'll see him in Penn Station and you're like, he's going to ask me for money. Like, he's one of these squatters that, that'll save up money and like, Dress up because he's a handsome guy. He looks like Ted. Yeah. He's, he'll dress up and get the apartment and then never leave. And he'll stay for like eighteen months because New York, you can't get rid of squatters, you know. And that—that's what a piece of shit he is, you know. And yeah. Like, oh my god. Now, now I'm rambling because I guess ca talking about drugs, caffeine is my drug of choice. <laughs> yeah. I don't like painkillers either, but when I was pulled off a telephone pole at ten feet off the street, we have me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's not a need for it. You know, I'm not saying like 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 childbirth. Numb that woman up. There's no need to feel pain in childbirth anymore. Man, I I I've never, never been pregnant, never had a baby, but the Democrats tell me I can, so maybe <laughs> you're just not trying hard enough. Yeah. Uh yeah. Uh no no need to. I I'm more mad than than mad. Before we were married, my wife's brother found naked wrapped in sheet after partying. I hope he's still alive. I, I I don't know whether to laugh or say I'm sorry <laughs> for this. Yeah, I know some good people out of the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had I had a friend in Albuquerque that we used to joke and say, you're, you're a future homeless person. Mm -hmm. And he'd be like, yeah, no. And I'll never forget, we were in college and his father came to check on him and he, he told me, he was, out of all of these people, you got a head on your shoulders. Can you watch out for my son? I was like, you got it. And uh, I, uh, you know, lost track of him. And every once in a while, I do Google searches to see how he's doing. He's probably like a CEO of a firm. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Marcus. That's why I, I didn't want to make any jokes. I, I I didn't know if this was like a funny story. I got so drunk, I was taped to a pole, you know, <laughs> which which happened to me. <laughs> we, we used to have a game. We, we, we were in like after high school, but before college, because we were a bunch of jerks. There was a long time between high school and college with us you know, drinking and wasting time. But the first one who fell asleep, you know, we it, would be, uh, it was all Irish and I was the only Italian and I would fall asleep first. So the joke was whoever falls asleep first is Italian. So I was just like, I'm not Italian. <laughs> 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 oh my God, Marcus. Yeah. My nephew was 29 with, with two sons. Yeah. So uh, I have a another chat at 10 o'clock. I'm going to do the fan yeah. chat, and that's also going to be open. This is going to be either a lot of fun 
or, or a very humiliating, embarrassing thing. We got 34 people watching. Um, at 10 o'clock, I'm gonna re I'm gonna go have dinner now, and then I'm gonna come back at 10. And it's an open invite, no promoting. You know, it's it's gonna be fans talking about comic books. So you know, and, and, and anybody's welcome to come in and, and join us. I, I know a few people have like have, have um, DM'd me saying, "Can I come in?" I was like, "Yeah." The only thing is, you know, I, I kind of want to talk to a face, so I don't want to talk to like you know avatars or people. So, but uh, you know. It's a guideline, not a hard rule. I got out of Seattle. Yeah, Seattle. Yeah, my my, my buddy, a couple of my buddies moved there because they were all into grunge. And then when the grunge thing was over, they they left. They said it was a uh, the end of an era. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll join you later. Okay, Marcus. So any anything you guys want to say? I know I I tend to talk too much. It's one of my one of my problems. Oh, just that everybody has to go back my comic now. Yes. Or we'll We'll track them down. I, yeah. I, I I expect to have 33 to 34 new backers by the time I refresh my page. It's up to them. And here we got uh, Webtoons, Illustrated Monks Webtoons. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I don't let them get it worded edgewise. Yeah, and follow me on, on Twitter. Uh, I usually post Possum Girl there, uh, but you don't get notified because I'm shadow banned. <laughs> really? Uh, so it's better to follow me on Mines if you have Mines, that's a better place. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I'll, I'll I'll retweet whatever you see. I'll, I'll retweet you see if that helps. I, I don't know if that'll help, but I'll, I'll do my best to try to help. And we got on calls. This this is going to be. Uh, you said it's going to be launching next week, right? On call heroes. What's that? Yes, uh, yeah. about a week and a half. Uh, and and you can go sign up now so that you get the notification. And, and of course, as always, there's my website where you can actually sign up and get on my mailing list. And then you don't have to go watch streams to find out what I'm doing. You, I'll just email you. Yes. So, and then, yeah, and any back issues also, um, you know, you don't, uh, folks don't have to wait for a campaign. They can actually get like backup bundles and stuff just off my website and then just back the comics as they come out. And you'll, you know, everybody gets their stuff quicker because whenever I get a order off of eBay or uh, yeah, you, my your website, stuff real quick. Yeah, I ship them out the, the very next day, so that's a good way to get caught up and stuff. And there's some there's some sales and stuff like that. And if hey. you're on my mailing list, I do I do send out like uh, uh, vouchers to get money off my website and all that, so you can get some free stuff. So it's a good good place to be. Get get tonic bucks. Tonic bucks. His Illustrated Monks links. I, 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 you know, all kidding aside, I, I love your artwork, and I, I I'm su super excited to see interior pages in, in, in uh, On Call Heroes. That is going to be so cool. Uh, and I think I showed everybody's, uh, everybody's uh, links. Thanks a lot, everybody. This was a lot of fun. As always with Tonic Bowl, I, I could talk forever, and we go off on tangents. But that, that I love that. That's why I say I'm having conversations with people. I'm not. I'm not. I, I don't. I don't want to do just like paid promos and things like that. You know, <laughs> right. Fun conversations, you know. You know, uh, Heronberg and Heronberg. You know, you. It's been a while since since I talked to you. Good luck, Ball. See you at Heroes. And uh, that's another thing. I I, I I want to go to HeroCon. I, I it, it all depends on if my comedy is a success or not. Because I got old childhood friends that are going. I could see Marcus and, and a bunch of other people. So that's that's something I, I, I'll I will. Keep that in mind. I, I can't make any promises at this point because my job is tough to get off. So uh, I get Illustrated Monk. Uh, I put your link here. Uh, I, I, I just feel bad. Invite you in and then talk over you. I'm, I'm, I'm the worst. Well, All you're right. not talking over me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Very Those are great. links to everything I'm involved with currently. Um, cool. I am working on I'll Call Heroes. That will be on there once I get it. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. I'm gonna I'm gonna wolf down my dinner while I got a half hour, I, I, and I'll, I'll I'll put up a link to uh, my ten o'clock chat. And everybody come back. Everybody come back. Uh, at the very least, somebody come back. So I, I'm not. <laughs> but I thought it would be a fun thing to let the fans talk. You know. All right. See you, everybody. Thanks a lot. See ya. Bye bye. Bye.